welcome to the Pro Black Perspective on KWZ Radio. Today we're going to uh, we're going to read the prints. Uh, it's a really short document. It looks like it's 59 pages. Uh, I don't really read that quickly. Let me know if you you can hear me well though, right? Uh, mic check one two one two. Cause I'm kind of sitting far from the uh, mic. One time, right? Can I be heard? Right, I'm kind of just chilling on my couch, minding my business, you know? But here's the book. It's Machiavelli. You can see the link in the description below. Um, and actually, pretty interesting. I'm just scrolling through, and I see the glossary. Look at this. Africa. At the time Machiavelli is writing, about on page 118, on page 18, Africa, named the coastal strip of North Africa, included some of what is now Tunisia, Algeria, and Libya. The site of city of Carthage is now the site of a suburb of Tunis. So that's pretty interesting right here. Um, so the time of his writing, Africa, named the coastal strip of North Africa. Uh, so, so at this point, Africa was just uh, North Africa. That's pretty interesting. Um, uh, element. So, and of course, you know, you've got to ask yourself, what year did he write this? So that's a pretty interesting uh, question. You know, mostly because a lot of people have that discussion on the etymology of Africa, and so it's kind of interesting to see uh, what that is. It, uh, if you want, I can look through this whole thing. I mean, it looks like, yeah, he used some words a couple of times, so let's just use this stuff. Uh, element, on page five, Machiavelli speaks of the more weak, uh, all right, cool, I mean, I can hear and be heard. Forever Don, Hotep, all right, on page five, Machiavelli, oh, of course, appreciation, thanks for uh, letting me know. Uh, on page, let me try to close this thing. Sorry. Okay, cool. I might be zoomed in a little bit too much. You know, you just gotta like make sure you got like a good reading, you know, grounds. So let's go. On page five, Machiavelli speaks of the more weak and more strong with no noun. He could be talking about weaker and stronger individuals or factions within the acquired state, or weaker and stronger substates or provinces of which the newly acquired state is made up. The rest of the chapter hooks into uh, the second definition, but page five also makes Machiavellian sense when taken in this manner. Uh, of, or perhaps he meant to be talking about both at once, right? So Fortuna, the word occurs nearly 60 times in the work. Most occurrences of it can be translated by luck, but for Machiavelli, its meaning is clearly broader than that, something more like circumstances beyond one's control. Interplay between this and virtue is a dominant theme in The Prince. Uh, so Fortuna is left untranslated, except where Machiavelli writes of someone's privita fortuna, meaning his status or condition as an ordinary citizen, rather than someone with rank and power. The five occurrences of this are all translated by ordinary citizen. Italian lets us choose between it and she for fortuna, but nothing in this work invites us to personalize it except the strikingly last paragraph on page 53. And so free, when Machiavelli speaks of people as living free, liberi or in freedom, in liberté, he usually means that they are self-governing rather than being subjects of a prince. So, you know, of course, that's something that you want to be. So on page 10, there's a good example of why it won't do to translate liberty by self-government throughout, or to translate it sometimes by self-government and sometimes by freedom. Uh, gentlemen, this seems to be the best we can do with uh, Machiavelli's gentile women, of women, but his meaning seems to be something more like men who have some kind of rank or title, thus making them his gentlemen. Uh, means giving each of them the kind of rank or title, or standing in his own court, or working with, within his own lord, government. So I would probably use the word lord for that, you know, like, you, you know, like a, like a knight or something like that. Um, prince. In this work, principe is it a title and doesn't not doesn't need a rank. It stands for any ruler of a state, whether a king, a queen, a prince, or a duke, or a duke or a count. Uh, the English word prince also had the broader meaning once. Queen Elizabeth I referred to herself as a prince. And it seems the best word to use here. So prince is not only, you know, the, the son of the king, but it could be the king, the queen, whatever. Temporal. It means having to do with the world as distinct from the heavenly world of the afterlife. Uh, the underlying thought is that this time, this world is in its time, temporal, whereas the afterlife is eternal in some ways that puts it outside of time. Interesting. So virtue, this word occurs 60 times in this word. It's interesting. Nearly 60 times, 60 times. And it's cognate. Uh, adjective virtuoso occurs another dozen times. A dominant theme throughout is the difference between virtue and fortuna as factors of, in a man's life. Usually virtue means something like ability, 
but it can mean strength or even virtue. It is left untranslated so that you can make your own decision about what Machiavelli means by any given occasion. And of course, you, Machiavelli sometimes switches suddenly from talking about what a prince must do to a talking about what you must do as though you were addressing the prince. Any such switch, the first is on page three, is Machiavelli's own and not an artifact of this version. So he's dedicated this to the quote unquote, I don't want to say, a magnificence, Lorenzo, whatever. All right, so they decide. So this is his patron. You know, that, that, you know, you see people got Patreon. <laughs> so this was a, a old school version of Patreon. You know, where you write a whole ass book uh, for some for some dude. But anyway, um, so let's see. Those who try to win the favor of a prince usually come to him with things that they regard as the most precious, or that they see him take most pleasure in. So we often, uh, so oft, so we often, we often see princes being presented with horses, arms cloth of goods, precious stones, and similar ornaments that are worthy of their greatness. Wanted to present myself to your magnificence with some tested in my devotion towards you. The possession of mine that I love best and value most is my knowledge of the actions of great men, knowledge that I have acquired from long experience in contemporary affairs and from a continual study of antiquity. Having reflected on it long and hard, I now send it, digested in a little volume, to your magnificence. So that's something that you want to see. So this guy, he now it's important, he has long experience in contemporary affairs, but also continual study of antiquity. So what Machiavelli is doing, and, and he becomes a legend in the Wazungu circles, right? But what he does is he studies antiquity. You know, some people sometimes get on my case, be like, Oni, why are you always studying antiquity? Because that's what people are supposed to do. All Everything that, what Machiavelli says, he, the possession of knowledge of the actions of great men. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, you know, I have my books. My books are about great men and women. Uh, and of course the study of antiquity. You know what I mean? So so this is like right up my alley in a sense. But let's keep going. Without being and no, I haven't read this yet. You know, I I, I you know, could once upon a time I was just like I'm not reading the white boys, but you know what? That F it. You know? Without being sure that this work is worthy of being presented to you, I'm trusting that you'll be kind enough to find it acceptable, saying that I can't give you anything better than the opportunity to get a grasp quickly of everything that has taken me so many difficult and dangerous years to learn. Many writers decorate their work, choke their work with smoothly sweeping sentences, pompous words, and other attractions that are relevant to the matter at hand. But I haven't done any of that because I have wanted the work of mine to be given only such respect as it can get from the importance of its topic and the truth of what it says about it. Some people think it would be presumptuous for a man whose status is low to discuss the concerns of princes and give them rules of how to behave, but I don't agree. A landscape painter will place himself on the plane in order to get a good view of the mountains, and on a mountain in order to get a good view of the plains. So also, to understand us, the, the nature of people, one needs to be a prince, and to understand the nature of princes, one needs to be of the people. Take, then, this little gift and the spirit in which I send it. If you read and think about it, you will see how greatly I want you to achieve that greatness which fortune and your other attributes promise. And if your magnificence from the mountaintop of your greatness will sometimes look down at the plains, you will see how little I deserve the wretched ill fortune that continually pursues me. Look at this guy, man. He's begging. You know, old school, <laughs> old school grifting back in the day, right? Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, all right. So let's see. Machiavelli worked for 18 years for the... Oh, so this is somebody making the notes. Machiavelli worked for 18 years for the Florentine Republic. When the Republic collapsed in 1512 under attack by the Medici, and their allies. So look at that. So he's writing to this guy, Medici. You see? He's writing to Medici, but they're the ones that destroy the republic that he was working in. And that's something you need to understand, too, that this is a time in Europe. So this is like around 15, the 16th century, right? This is a, and, and look, you know, notice this. The 16th century, uh, Europe already had begun invading Africa, you know? Uh, and, you know, enslaving Afri uh, you know, Africans in the sense that, you know, it was like in the, around the 1400s. Uh, around the four, four, the 15th century, but also you know understand that the Arabs already had enslaved us from like the 9th century. So there's a lot going on in, in the world, but he's still like in his little bubble. Where but even notwithstanding though, in his little bubble, he's attacked by this other uh, people, the Medici, right? Who who destroy his republic, and now he's all you know trying to you know oh well, I, I I deserve better than this, you know? But whatever. He lost his elevated governmental position, was accused of conspiracy, questioned under torture, then released and retired to his farm where he wrote The Prince and Other Works. After six or seven years of this, Machiavelli did administrative work for some Florentine merchants, was consulted by the Medici government on a policy question, returned to Florence where he was celebrated as a writer, was engaged by Cardinal Luigi to write a history of Florence, hoped to re-enter high levels of government when in 1527 the Medici was again rejected. 
and the Florentine Republic reestablished. Look at that. The Medici, so after these guys ruled for 15 years, they, uh, they whatever, and then he died you know, shortly after. But but he was trying to enter the government, you know, uh, and that's the thing that you got to take opportunity. Now 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 you don't you don't want to see this like back in the days, and back in the Europe at least, uh, you know, like how we see political parties. That's not that's not that's not how that's not what it was. This was people attacked and took over, and that's the thing that you have to realize how fundamental uh, warfare is in in human history, and 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 just how, and and then of course the people on the on the people who who don't take part in a sense. Or who have to exist, notwithstanding the different battles that the higher people are engaging in. So the princes, in this case, are engaging in warfare. You know, the Medicis, and so on and so forth. Because like I, I don't know. I think later on you're gonna see his account. I think this guy's account, uh, which is basically just like a, a manager, like one of the war, like one of the generals in a sense. You know, uh, what well, I say. The continuing wretched ill fortune of which he writes consisted in poverty and the lack of worthy employment during his years on the farm. The prince was not published until after his death. The recipient of the dedication was not the famous Lorenzo the Magnificent, patron of Leonardo Michelangelo, but a grandson of his. So apparently, uh, Lorenzo the Magnificent was a, uh, 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 whatever, the, the guy who did the, uh, I guess the Sistine Chapel, I think? Hi. Anyway, let's see, part one. So, kinds of principality, how to get and retain them. So different kinds of principalities, and how to acquire them. So obviously, so prince and principality are related. So principality would just be like your your government. You know what I mean? Like, and that's the thing that we have to, uh, you know, like when we ask ourselves about black nationalism and black nationhood, we have to understand that one of our objectives is a principality. You know, and 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 the thing is that th it's so unrealistic today that people like people are not really discussing this to be honest. You know. People are not really discussing this. They're not really discussing the ideas of self-government and what that entails, but hopefully this kind of outlines it. So it's a really short chapter. So all states, all power that rule over men are either republics or principalities. I'm saying this about the past as well as the present, right? Principalities are either hereditary, governed by one family over very many years, or they are new. So a principality, so a republic is, you know, when, you know, I mean, he'll probably go over it, but uh, hereditary, governed by one family over very many years. And this was really important. I want you to realize, too, because when, we, when we're discussing African nationalism, a lot of times, like, for instance, I was looking through some human rights, you know, and of course, you know, uh, Brother Koku had a, you know, the Bitter American podcast. He had a podcast on human rights as well. But I was looking at the African Union of Human Rights, and a lot of it was encouraging democracy. And it looked and it sounded good. But you got to realize that governed by one family for very many years, when you talk about ancient Kemet, right, or even you talk about the different, uh, you know, like spiritual systems in Africa, you realize that, like for instance for Kemet at least, you had dynasties. You know, and a dynasty is this, governed by one family over very many years, you know? And of course, you know, today what we see is kind of like dynasties in these new uh, nations in Africa, but they're so poorly run that we kind of dislike them, you know what I mean? Uh, now, naturally, like, I feel like, and that's what I'm saying, it's, it's kind of tough to, 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 to really process, you know, what is the best process, uh, what is the best system. Uh, a republic, obviously, wouldn't be governed by one family, so the hereditary, so basically, principality would be when you pass it down to your kid, or if you just newly establish something. So, a new principality may be entirely new, as Milan was to Francesco Sforza. Or it may be, so to speak, a limb grift grafted onto the hereditary state of the prince who had acquired it, as when the kingdom of Naples was acquired by grafted onto the kingdom of Spain. Uh, dominion acquired in this way may have been accustomed before the acquisition to live under a prince, or may have lived in freedom, and the uh, acquisition may have happened throughout the arms of the acquiring prince himself, or through the arms of others, and the acquisition may have been a matter of fortuna or a product of virtue, right? So hereditary principality. So I shan't discuss republics because I've written about them at length elsewhere. So republics are probably what you want to read about because I, I feel like most people are trying to establish a republic, to be honest. Uh, republic being that, you know, you have people vote and then they have their representatives and their representatives blah, 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 right? Which is different from, which is uh, the thing is that it's so, con it's actually contrasted to the way that Africans had done things uh, like especially if you like study different 
the African civilization and so forth, like, you know, the Council of Elders, right? The Council of Elders uh, is more like, it's more or less, you know, each family uh, has an elder in that circle. You get what I'm saying? So it's not really like a republic in the sense of, you know, we voted for them, you know? So, I mean, you kind of do want to see, because it's, it's pretty interesting, because in this modern age, you know, most people want republics. But, you know, is it because of Western, uh, is it because of Westernism? So it, w it would be pretty interesting to know where he writes about republics, but, you know, whatever. I shan't discuss republics. Uh, and it's interesting, because the United States is like a republic. Uh, I shan't discuss republics because I have written about them at length elsewhere. My sole topic here will be principalities. My presentation will be organized in terms of the classification given in Chapter 1, and we will discuss how e such principalities will be ruled and preserved. I say at the outset that it is easier to hold a hereditary state than has well, that has long been accustomed to their princely family than it is to hold a new state. A hereditary prince doesn't have to work very hard to retain a state. All he needs is to abide by the customs of his ancestors. Look at that. They, 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 they listen to their ancestors. And this is something that you have to understand, like, when we talk about white folk. Because, look, I want you to understand how fundamental prince, uh, the prince this book is. Okay? This book is one of the classics in Wazungu, our, uh, Wazungu uh, history. Right? So they have to abide by the customs of their ancestors. A lot of times, like, like this, is what, this is what a lot of what conservatism, like, for instance, like, let's say in America, this is what conservatism is about. It's about abiding by the customs of their ancestors. They don't want to, like, when Obama, Obama comes into office, okay? He's a suave, smooth, you know, likable gentleman, right? And it's like, this is not what our ancestors wanted, you know? Or even, you know, now that they got Kamala Harris, they're like, this is not what our ancestors, this is not according to the customs of our ancestors. We don't like this. Now, of course, they're in a republic, but of course they're used to hereditary principalities, right? And, of course, get himself through minor emergencies, unless, unless, of course, some extraordinary or extreme force deprives him of his state, and even then he will get back if a usurper runs into trouble. We have an example in Italy. The Duke of Ferrara couldn't have survived the attacks of the Venetians in 1484 or those of Pope Julius in 1510 if he hadn't been long established in his dominion. Yeah, so uh, so basically he was attacked and he was, and he was able to think. This is, about two, there's, this is about two Dukes of Ferrara Ercole in 1484 and Alfonso in 1510. Perhaps Machiavelli's singular duke was meant to make the point that within a single hereditary principality, it doesn't matter much who the prince is at a given time. Because a hereditary prince has less cause to offend his people and less need to do so, he will be more loved. The subjects will naturally think well of him unless extraordinary vices cause them to hate him. The next sentence, uh, Inella Antupai, or, and in antiquity and duration of his rule, the memories and motives that make for changes are lost. For once, change always repairs. For one, one change always repairs the way for the next. Okay, so he's just saying that he tried to translate it, and it's, it's just nonsense. All right, so mixed principality. So where difficulties arise in a new principality, let us take first the case of a principality that isn't entirely new, but is, so to speak, a limb of a larger state, which, taken as a whole, could be called composite, a composition, a combination of old and new an old state to which another state has been newly annexed. The changes through which new principalities come into being always have a built-in source of difficulty. Men who change their rulers willingly are hoping to better themselves, which is what gets them to take up arms against their present ruler, and they are deceived in this because they always discover in due course that they have gone from bad to worse. Why? Because a new prince ordinarily naturally has to burden those who have submitted him with the requirement that they provide quarters for his troops and with the countless other hardships. So you have as enemies all those whom you have harmed in seizing that principality, and you can't keep the friends who put you there because you can't satisfy them in the way they expected, and you can't take strong measures against them because you still need them. For however strong your armed forces are in entering a new province, you will need the goodwill of the people of the place. That is why Louis the Twelfth uh, of France quickly took Milan and quickly lost it. To turn him out the first time, it only needed Lodovico's own forces, the forces of the Duke who had been conquered by Louis, because those who had opened Milan's gate to King Louis, finding themselves deceived in their hopes of benefiting from this, wouldn't endure the harsh treatment they were getting from the new ruler. So this is actually pretty important when we talk about, you know, uh, African, you know, Pan-African nationalism. You know, there's going to be, wherever you go, now there's a lot of land that's not occupied in Africa, but there's not a lot of, lot of land that's not occupied, in the sense of not a lot of contiguous land. Eventually, 
you're going to find that there are people who are already there. And they're already dealing with, uh, you know, bad rulers. But um, the question becomes, can you be a better ruler? You know, can you have a better government? And of course you could. But the, the, but then there's the, the question of, well, what if these rulers fight you, right? And what does it mean that now you're fighting and you're, you, you brought war to their town? You know, what are they going to just sit by and let you bring war to them? Now, now if people are radicalized in a large uh, capacity, then sure. You know, uh, it's like it's like you look go back to the handbook that uh, Nkrumah wrote, right? Uh, what what he when he wrote it, he was saying, look, you know, revolutionaries might need to hide in villages. They might need to hide in town. So you have to have the people radicalized to actually want to hide the revolutionaries because if they aren't, then they're going to fight you because you're taking the war to them. You understand? You're taking the war to them. And not just that, you're going to have to house your soldiers there, you know, eventually. And, and they're going to say to themselves, now, why am I dealing with this? So, of course, if you're really serious about, like I said, if you're really serious about Pan-African nationalism, you have to, uh, like, 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 get involved in the process of working to, uh, you know, really revolutionize our people so that you know, when the time comes that they need to hide soldiers or they need to fight for themselves, like, they're they're not reluctant, you know? And and not just that, like, the war can be won easily because because you have to deal with the morale of your military as well as the morale of, of, of the people that whose land you're on, you're fighting on. And so it, it behooves you to not try to set the stage so that you don't get this advantage later, you know? Like, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is warship. You know, this is worship. Come on. All right. So, better friend, wouldn't this endure the harsh treatment that they were getting for the new rulers? So, when a rebellious province is retaken, it won't be so easily lost a second time because the prince would have learned from the rebellion not to hesitate to punish the delinquents, to sort out the suspects, and to fix any weakness in his position. You see what I'm saying? Uh, this is this is what's happening all over Africa, where where they're they're paying attention to who the delinquents are, right? They do, they know how to sort out the suspects and to fix any of the weaknesses in their position. That's why you try to broadly radicalize. You know, you broadly radicalize because they can't punish everybody. You know? You might have you know, it's it's like it's like like like, like for instance white folk right now in America are, are looking to weed out the revolutionaries, weed out the, the troublemakers, weed out whatever. But instead of but because everybody's trying to talk this radical, everybody's trying to talk this black stuff, right? They can't necessarily find who's who. You know? So that's a good thing. That's why you want to you want to just keep giving out the the radicalism because if it's just one person, you know, saying down with the state, you know what I mean? They already know who it is. But if all te if if there's if there's 20 people and 19 of them are like down with the state, right? And only one of them serious, right? Th they're not gonna you know take out the 19 people. You get what I'm saying? Because if they're just left with one out of 20 people, then that then they're screwed as an economy. I mean, they're already screwed as a kind, but they're really screwed. You know, they're screwed like in a, in a bigger sense. So it's 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 imperative that you you try. Like I said, we got to reach the consciousness of African people. We have to we have to go and be active on the ground about it. So, thus, whereas Duke Lodovico could have t taken Milan back from France the first time, merely by sword riding along its borders, to get it back a second time, he needed everyone's help in defeating the French armies and driving them out of Italy. The reason why this was so difficult are the ones I just presented. Still, Milan was taken back from France not just once but twice. I have discussed the general reasons for the first French failure. It remains the name for the second. What resources the French king have? How might someone in this situation have held on to his conquest better than he did? Distinguishing two cases. When a state with a long history acquires a new domination, a new dominion, either the new dominion has the same language as the other and is geographically right next to it, or it doesn't and isn't. And here's the thing. See what I'm saying? A new dominion that is ge that same language and geographically right next to it, or it doesn't and it isn't. Any case of a kind, a it is easier to hold on to the new dominion, especially if the people haven't been accustomed to live in freedom. To hold it securely, one needs to uh, one needs only to destroy the family of the prince who was its ruler. See that they they, they kill off the family prince, the prince family, because then with conditions of the new dominion the same as before and with pretty much the same customs established in the, the two territories, the people will live quietly together. We have seen this in Brittany, Burgundy, Gascony, and Normandy. And notice that these places, Brittany, Normandy, these are like, I think these are like, uh, like in, in, in Britain and France. And Britain and England. Or maybe just Britain, I don't know. But which have, oh, actually, no, I think Normandy is in France, to be honest. 
which have stayed united to France for such a long time. And look at that, he just said, uh, and though there may be some difference in language, the customs are alike, and the people can easily get on with one another. Now, I think this is, I, now, when he says France, I think this is the modern translation, because maybe France was not a state back then. You know, because these are actually the different tribes of the French. Uh, you know, I know, I know, I know Normandy from, uh, you know, World War II references, right? You know, they say they stormed Normandy or something like that. So someone who acquires such a state, if he wants to hold on to it, might take uh, care of two and other two things. That the family of the state's former prince extinguished, look at that, and that neither the laws or the taxes are altered. With those things taken care of, it won't take long for the newly acquired dominion to become entirely one body with a long-standing prince of Elliot as a dynastic thing. But when, and look at that, changing the laws and the taxes, you see what I'm saying? Like, like when we talk about nationalism, we're talking about laws. We're talking about putting our own laws in place and our own taxes. You know, like I said, you know, go and listen to uh, Bitter Medicine podcast. I just listened to his Human Rights uh, podcast, and he was saying that you know, that like wealthy people, like rich people, can can you know sexually assault a woman, you know, and get away with it. You know, particularly in America, like they get a slap on the wrist, they get like three months, only serve one month you know, because they're rich and white and all that, right? Whereas a black person would get a whole bunch of years. And of course, a black, you know, anybody should get a whole bunch of years. You know, that's that's terrible. But but the thing is this, there are some countries where, th like, like that's like that's just normal, you know? Uh, sexual assault is looked the way, you know, th so nobody cares or whatever, right? You'd want to change that. You understand? You, you'd, want to, you'd want some rights. You want some uh, sort of sober. You want, uh, or like, for instance, you know, that might be the subject of, like, like in, the, in this pamphlet I'm writing, I'm talking about, you know, how we all have, we all have the right to, uh, you know, clean water, clean air, clean, uh, you know, clean energy, right? And, I, and of course, I, I express that, you know, you need power for that, you know, that you're not just going to get it, obviously. But, you know, we have to acquire power so that we can get that. But the idea is that, you know, like right now, you know, you might not have, like a child might not have access to clean water. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and, and that, that would have to change. You know, of course, that might not be a legal thing, a lawful thing, uh, you know, or it might not be unlawful for a child to have access to water. But, you know, these are the things that we would want to implement. And, of course, taxes. You know, we would want to collect taxes. You know, that's just something that uh, we've done in, uh, you know, on the continent for a long time. And it's not something that we want to discontinue. Uh, but, but again, you know, like, what does that mean? What does that entail? What does that look like? There's a lot of things uh, to consider here. So, but when uh, a country acquires a state that differs from it in language, customs or laws, there are difficulties. And holding on to the newly acquired acquisition requires good fortuna and great energy. One of the best things that the acquiring ruler can do is to go and live in the newly acquired state, which would make his position more secure and durable. That's what it did for the Turk in Greece. Despite all his other measures for holding the state, if he hadn't settled there, he couldn't have kept it. There are at least three reasons for this. If the ruler is on the spot, he can see troubles as they arise and can quickly deal with them. Whereas if he isn't there, he won't hear of them until they have grown beyond the point where he can fix them. If you are living there, the country won't be pillaged by your officials. And if that doesn't, and if that does start to happen, your subjects will be glad to have immediate access to their on-the-spot prince. Subjects who are well disposed towards the prince will have more reason to love him, and those who aren't will have more reason to fear him. Anyone wanting to attack the state from the outside has better go about it carefully. As long as the prince is living there, it will be very hard to take it from him. Uh, so, that's another thing, too. It's like, if you want to have a state in Africa, even though we don't, like, let's say the language is, there's a huge language barrier, huge customs and laws barrier in Africa. You know, even even this guy is saying, go live there. You know? Like, if, if you're serious about nation building, right, then you have to go live there so that you can address the issues and fix the problems while you're there. You know, you can get the appreciation of the people while you're there, as opposed to like, like, what, what is the objective? Like, where, where do we, where do we get off of, you know, oh, well, we wanna, we wanna, we want a nation in Africa, and then we're not even there, or some of us are not there, or some of us are not where we want the land to be, or where we want the nation to be, because a lot of people are in Africa. Obviously, most black people are in Africa, but uh, are we all localized where we believe that the nation should be? You know. Uh, but of course, that's after you already took the nation. But you know, that's the that's the that's another point to you know whatever. 
Uh, and of course, you see how he says officials will try to exploit. You know that he said that somewhere. Uh, where is he says? Oh yeah, the, uh, the officials. The country won't be pillaged by your officials. You know what I mean? So, so this is something that's normal by one's own rule, right? An even better procedure is to send colonies to one or two places within a newly acquired state to serve as shackles, so to speak. Look at that. He says colonies. It's a choice between doing this and keeping their large garrison of cavalry and infantry. Establishing and maintaining a colony costs little or nothing, and the only people who are offended by are the minority whose lands and houses are given to the new inhabitants, the colonists, and they can't do the prince any harm because, oh, he says this is the other way. Even better procedure is to send colonies. There you go. Uh, to give the new, new inhabitants the colonists, and they can't do the prince any harm because they are poor and scattered, and the remainder are, oh, look at this. New Hamlets, the colonists, and they can't do the prince any harm because they are poor and scattered, and the remainders are easily kept quiet. They haven't been injured in any way. They don't want to put a foot wrong for fear of being treated in the same way as the dispossessed minority. This illustrates a general point, namely that men should be treated in such a way that there is no fear of their seeking revenge, either well treated so that they won't want revenge, or utterly crushed so that they won't be capable of it. So look at this right here. You see, uh, this is this is uh, one of the main things of this book is the idea of of how you use fear to control people, and and you see, and this is what I'm saying to you right now because you have to understand. Look at this. Look at this. Minority, dispossessed minority. You know, a lot of times when we talk about racism, right? We we fail to realize that the the, the treatment of quote unquote uh, black folk is as a dispossessed minority. You know, they say, look, like 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 he's saying this. He's saying you send colonists, you send people to build a colony, right? To build a you know like their own little mini nation in a new nation, right? And 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 they're going to scatter, they're gonna they're gonna like displace some poor people, some poor and scattered people. Okay, and the remainder are gonna be like, okay, I don't want the same thing to happen to me, so I'm not gonna fight it. I'm not gonna quarrel. But of course, it didn't, it, and it, it, you know, it didn't happen to them. So they're not really sweating it like the people who were dispossessed, right? But he's saying, look, you. This illustrates a general point. You you treat people in such a way that they fear seeking revenge, either because they're well treated, right? So you give them some comfort, you know, you trade with them, you, you treat them nice, right? And, and so that they won't want revenge, and that's that's what they or, or you utterly crush them, so that they're incapable of revenge, you know. And I said like this is the situation you find in in, in, in like all, all over the world, but you know let's just re re relate it to uh, well we can relate it to Black America, but also like Black Africa, and just this idea that there are some people who are well treated, who don't want to, you know, first off who don't want to be treated like those N words, you know what I'm saying? And then there's of course there's the people who are utterly crushed, you know. Right? You could think of you could think of uh, the the shanty towns. You could think of the ghetto. You could think of so on and so forth. You could think of the place where you you know damn well the white boy could send you, or even the prisons. You know damn well a concentration camp. They had concentration camps in Africa. You already know that, right? You know damn well they can do that to you. You know. So 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 th these are the things that that they they do. And this is something that like I said, this is written this is written in uh, 16th century. You know what I mean? Now, there, of course, there's things going on in Africa, obviously, but he's not writing about he's not writing about you. He's not writing about your black ass in uh in the in the hood, you know, in 1960s. You know what I mean? He's writing about white folk conquering white folk. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, like the proverb goes, if the if the frog eats the flesh of uh, no, if the crocodile eats the flesh, no, if the crocodile eats its own eggs, right? If the crocodile eats its own eggs, what do you think it's going to do to the flesh of a frog? You know, if this white boy is, 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 is controlling his own people through fear, through either crushing them or giving them a little bit of treatment, well treatment, right? What do you think he's going to do to you? Come on. You think he's going to roll the red carpet out for you? you think he's going to roll? You think you're a celebrity? Come on. Anyway. So it costs much more to have an armed garrison than to have colonies. Maintaining it can take the entire income of the newly acquired state so that the acquisition of it turns into a loss. Also, shifting the garrison from place to place with a constant need to take over people's homes as quarters for the soldiers makes everyone happy. Everyone suffers hardship and becomes hostile, and there are enemies who can still do harm 
because although they have been beaten, they are still on their own ground. However, you look at it, military occupation is as useless as colonization is useful. So he's saying the best way to, uh, and look at this right here, he's writing this in the 16th century. Of course, Wazungu goes on to colonize Africa, right? But he's saying, you know, you don't need to military occupy, you don't need to do military occupation if you can colonize a people, okay? This is why you don't see too many, you know, soldiers on the ground from, from, from Wazungu, you know? Wazungu understands that you can either utterly crush a people. So France understands that you can go to Africa, you know, you go to Algeria and utterly crush people, okay? Or, and you can also well treat other people. France understands that. Uh, 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 wherever understands that. So it's up to us to give that understanding to our people. You know, to say, look, the only reason why they, they colonize you, the only reason why they give you that well treatment is so that you don't seek revenge for your dispossession, for the dispossession of your brothers and sisters. He wrote it out. Okay? Come on. A prince who takes power in a country differing in laws and language from his own people ought to make himself the head and defender of the weaker of his new subject and to weaken the most powerful among them and also to see to it that no foreigner as powerful as himself ever gets a footing there. So look at that right here. He's like this is this is how they conquered Africa. Cause look, it takes power in a country differing in laws and language. The countries in Africa have different laws and language, right? So his own people, right? He said ought to make himself the head and defender of the weaker of his new subjects. You know, when when England shows up in in in, in Ghana, it's like, hey, I'm the I'm your defender from France. I'm your defender from Portugal. And he says, weaken the more powerful amongst them. He, he, he destroys the Akai. He destroys the Ebo. He destroys the whatever, right? Uh, and I mean, I know they're not all in the same area, but, you know, look, I'm not, I'm not, you know, whatever. All right. And also to see that no foreigner is powerful himself. He says, look, we're going to have a Berlin conference, okay? Fr um, France, you can't be on this land. Germany, you can't be on this land. It's all outlined. Y'all, 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 y'all this? Oh, bro, why, 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 why uh, oh, Future says I could be louder. Uh, alright, hold on, let me move the mic closer. But y'all peeping this? Sure. Hold on a second, let me see if I could, let me see if I could move this mic a little closer. Is that louder? All right. So, but y are y'all peeping that? I mean, I don't know if y'all heard that because, you know, I'm just hearing that I might have been a little bit quiet. But that's the Berlin Conference outlined. That's the Berlin Conference outlined. You know, did y'all did, did, did y'all get that? Somebody tell me. Uh, tell me tell me if y'all got that. Anyway, so so that's 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 deep, right? So if that does happen, it'll be because the foreigner was invited in by subjects who are driven by ambition or by fear. We see this in the entry of the Romans into Greece, invited in by the Ayatolians, and in every other country that they have entered at the invitation of the inhabitants. What usually happens when a powerful foreigner enters the country is that the weaker elements side with him, motivated by their hatred for the ruling power, so that uh, he doesn't have to work at getting them on his side. He has only to take care that they don't get too much power and authority and then he will and then with his own forces and their goodwill he can easily keep the more powerful elements under control and thus remain entirely master in the country. A ruler who doesn't properly manage his business will soon lose his acquisition and for as long as he does have it will uh, give him endless difficulties and troubles. So I mean and this is the too right here. You see how he mentions the Greeks and the Romans? The reason why and see a lot of times we confuse it. You know we confuse it. We say why do people talk about uh, uh, Greece and Rome and they want to talk about their ancestors, so you got to talk about this, blah, blah, blah. No. The reason why they talk about their ancestors is because they can learn lessons from them. You understand? You, you shouldn't just talk about Kemet because it's nice and it makes you feel good. You should see what lessons there are to learn in Kemet. Just like you should see what lessons there are to learn 
in 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 in, in Ghana. What lessons there are to learn in Songhai. What lessons there are to learn in 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 uh, Mutapa. You know what kind of lessons are there? You know because he's telling you when he studies antiquity, he's seeing that the Romans were invited in were invited into the, into Greece and they knew to just keep the, the 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 Greeks who invited them weaker than them. You understand? And this is something that, that white people do when they, they say, look, because we say, oh, white people come in and they divide and conquer. No. What they do is they look for ways in. They get an ally. They get an internal ally and they keep their ally strong but weak. Stronger than others, right? Stronger than the more aggressive people, but weaker than them. You understand? And that's how they manage to keep control. You understand? And it's the same. It's the same going on. What's going on in Africa right now? Because, like, like I said, if I go to Africa right now and I'm talking, I'm just radical and I'm this whatever, right? Now, I, you know, obviously I gotta hush up, hush up, right? But let's say if I, the reason why I gotta hush up, hush up, is because the people in power in Africa right now got some power. You understand? They're more powerful than the elements. They're more powerful. No, they, they, they are. Look at this right here. He's only taking care that they don't get too much power. They don't have too much power and too much authority that, uh, and then with his own forces, then the forces in Europe, but they're more powerful than the elements that they want to uh, keep under control, you know? Uh, so that so that the people in Europe can remain uh, entirely masters, can remain masters of the country because the people in the country don't develop the strength and the power that they need. I'm telling you, right now he's outlining... He's telling you straight up how they colonized you, what they did to colonize you, right? And instead of you, you know, I mean, maybe some of y'all looked into it. Some of y'all, a lot of y'all already looked into this, but, but this is something that we should already like. This is this is just to be common knowledge, you know. I don't really like Wazungu books, but I'm I'm starting to see that you know I could read a few. You know what I mean? But let's see, a ruler who hasn't probably. So let's see, the Romans went about things in just this way in the country they annexed. They sent colonies. Maintain friendly relations with the less powerful. See what I'm saying? He learns from the Romans. He's not just looking at Romans because they white. Oh, you white. I'm white. Therefore, no. He's like, look, the Romans went about this in this way. They sent colonies. They maintained friendly relations with the less powerful elements without increasing their power. They kept down the more powerful elements and didn't allow any strong foreign powers to gain authority. This is the Berlin Conference. Kept down the more powerful elements. This is, you know, oh, they go down and destroy the Zulu. They go down and destroy the Dahomey. They go down and destroy so on and so forth. Maintain friendly relations. You understand? Sorry, I shouldn't even say Dahomey. They maintain friendly relations with Dahomey. And they destroy the, 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 strong, the more powerful elements like the Akan and the so on and so forth. They went, they, this is what they did, sent colonies. You know, they sent colonies. One example of this will be enough. I think Greece, uh, the Romans kept on friendly terms with the Archaeans, the Aetolians, and humbled the kingdom of Macedonia. So Macedonia is obviously, actually I don't remember. Anyway, <laughs> I was going to say that's the one that, the, no, Spartacus, I think Sparta is the one that they fight. I don't know. But anyway, driving Antichius out, but the service of the, and these are all tribes, you see what I'm saying? But the service of the Archaeans and the Aetolians didn't win them any permission to increase their power. Philip wasn't able to talk his way into friendship with the Romans until they had first humbled him. And the power of Antichus did it. I'm not, I'm not going to pronounce this right. I don't care. Oh, okay. What well, I could. No, no. For effort. Didn't make them uh, consent to his having any political status in the province, Macedonia. When the Romans did in these cases should be done by any prudent prince who was concerned not only with present trouble, but also with future ones. He must work really hard to prepare for those they are easy to cure if you look ahead of them. Whereas if you do nothing until they are almost upon you, it will be too late for medicine. The malady will become incurable. And I want to say this too. I, I want to say this too. Uh, this is also something that, you know, this is something that they do, uh, what we call the Democratic Party. Or, or the different parties, different political parties in different countries. Is that when they're looking for, like in the republics, you know, because we want to talk about republics too. So what they do is they groom leaders, Right? Who can assume the political uh, thing, political authority? Who don't rock the boat? You know what I mean? And this is why they kill certain of those black leaders. Because you say to yourself, like, really, real talk. You know, you think about what what would happen if Dr. King ran for president. You understand? What would happen if Dr. King ran for president? 
you, they weren't going to entertain it. You know what I mean? Because technically he could have had a popular will on his side. I think they were saying that, you know, Dr. King was one of those one of those rare black men, uh, you know, one of those rare black people who were more popular than the president. You know what I mean? Uh, the same as, like, Michelle Obama. She could run, but, you know, whatever. But the idea is that, you know, you 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 don't want... Like, if somebody is that popular, that, that they, they cannot be... Like, they have to be within your control. Otherwise, you know, they're a goner. And that's that's the thing that, that, that happens. Like, even if I go into Africa, you know, I have to... Like, whatever state that I'm in, or whatever country you're in, if you're in Africa, whatever country you, you, you find yourself in, you know, you have to, you have to kind of almost limit your popularity, you know? You have to give deference to the space that you're in, because if you don't, you know, chances are you can get it, you can get into some serious trouble, you know? Uh, that's just like, you know, pro tip, you know? So, so you'd want to be more radical outside of your home base, uh, un, un, unless or until the time comes for otherwise, but of course, you know, you don't, need to, you don't need to articulate that, and it might not necessarily be that, that you want the time to come for otherwise. You know what I mean? Because it, it could be the time to just move and move on and, you know, become a, a brother or an ally of, of the former nation that hosted you. You know, but you don't want to cause trouble where you're being hosted uh, so much, you know? And that's, uh, that's just, you know, pro tip. You know what I mean? So Machiavelli compares this with these physicians, say, about tuberculosis at this early stage, hard to spot but easy to cure. Later on, visible to everyone but incurable. He continues... That's how it is in the affair of states. If future troubles are foreseen, which they can be, but only by very intelligent people, they can be quickly fixed. But if they aren't foreseen and are therefore allowed to grow to a size where everyone can see them, they are beyond cure. So, you know, this is, this is, this is like what I was saying, you know? Like, like, you, you, like Dr. King running for president. Like, we don't even, like, it didn't even happen. It wasn't even something we considered. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know. It could have been that it was circulated. Let me actually see if, if there was actually a rumor. Uh... My man said, uh, well, Future said they read this book thinking they were going to be a drug dealer. That's, that's random. But, uh, <laughs> let me see if, uh, uh, Martin Luther King, King Jr. wanted to be president, you know? Uh, oh, no. So there's an article that said why he didn't run for president. Uh, uh, let me just see. Let's see. Uh, presided over Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, yeah, okay. So I said that he actually did consider the prospect. But that's what I'm saying. Like, you can't, you can't think that you're going to run for president in a nation. Like, it's, it's like, if, if people can foresee a problem they're going to try to fix it immediately, you know? And that's, that's why, you know, like I said, if you go to Africa and you're like, hey, we need to, I need to burn down this state that I'm in, right? If 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 you're making too much of a loud noise in the state that you're in, because even if you make it a loud noise in the state that's adjacent to you, they can send assassins after you, you know? There's there's this, uh, the speaker, uh, you know, I think she's one of the, you know, one of the most radical, cool sisters on uh in the, in, the, in the world right now right uh her name is farida right and farida is saying that you know she's trying to she's i think she's fighting for togo i think and she's just like down with this you know dynasty you know she wants dem democracy and republic and all that stuff right but she's like down with this dynasty because they're abusing the people they're arresting the people they're abusing like harming the people like you know brutal brutal prison system all that stuff but guess what she says she doesn't live in the same place for like more than a week or something like that, you know what I mean? She's been moving around different places, you know, for how many for how many years now, you know? Because there are assassins after her, even though she's living in America, you know. So this dude all the way in Africa is sending people to kill her, you know? Uh, and that's that's just what it is, you know? So so you making a stir about oh I think this country, you know, like you say you do the whole Togo thing, you're like yeah Togo garbage. Blah, 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 right? And then you, you in the middle of whatever other nation, right? You in the middle of, you know, let's say the Gambia or something, right? You like Togo's garbage, blah, 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 blah. They just, they just, you know, find you one day at the bar while you, yeah, you know, every week at the bar, you like, oh, come to my meeting at the bar. They find you at the bar and they just shoot you because you are this. You know, you're something that grow that grows in size 
you know, and they don't want it to grow beyond the point. You know? They don't want you to grow beyond the point. Uh, accordingly, the Romans foresee... And that, that's, that's actually what you see in the paper by... Uh, by... Uh, uh, what's his name? That white boy. What's that guy's name? The white boy. He, he this, the, He's the FBI agent. But yeah, him. He says... Uh, you know, th these are the black folk that, you know, you don't want a black messiah, if you will. You know what I mean? And he just, he just straight up decides to body people. Uh, let's see if, uh, let me see if I'm, all right, let's keep going. So, accordingly, the Romans foreseeing trouble well ahead of time dealt with them ahead of time. Uh, they wouldn't let them come to a boil, even if preventing them from doing so involved going to war, for they knew that in situations like this, war can't be avoided and putting it off will work to the advantage of others. So they chose to fight Philip and Antiochus in Greece so as to not have to fight them later on in Italy. They might have avoided both, but they chose not to try that way out. And they weren't believers in the saying that we constantly hear from the wise men of our day, let us enjoy the benefits of the passing of time, because they were more interested in the benefits of their own virtue and foresight. You see what I'm saying? He's saying that they go to war, they go to war, they bring the war to Greece instead of having the war taken to Italy. You know what I'm saying? So they send the assassins to the Gambia instead of waiting for you to fight them in Togo. You understand? Come on. They knew that it's no good relying for help on the sheer passage of time because time herds everything along, bringing good things as well as bad, bad things as well as good. Let us turn now to France. And I'm kind of reading this too slowly. I don't know if I can read the whole thing, so I'm just going to... I'll probably just do half of it, you know. Let us turn now to France and inquire whether it did any of the things I have been talking about. I'll speak of Louis the Twelfth and not his predecessor of the French throne, Charles the Eighth, because Louis had possessions in Italy for longer, so it is easier to see his conduct. What we see, what we find, is that he did the opposite of what is needed if one is to retain a conquered state, different from one's own language and laws. King Louis was brought into Italy by the ambition of the Venetians who planned to get control of half the state of Lombardy, while letting him have the other half. I don't blame the king for his part in the affairs. He wanted a foothold in Italy and had no friends there. Instead, indeed, he found all doors barred against him because of King Charles' behavior, so he had to take what friendship he could get. He might have carried off very successfully if it weren't for the mistakes he made in his other arrangements. By taking Lombardy, the queen quickly regained his reputation lost by Charles. Genoa yielded. The Florentines turned friendly, and he was approached with professions of friendship by the Marquis of Mantua, the Duke of Ferrara, the Bendibar, blah, 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 and the citizens of Lucca. At this point, the Venetians began to see the folly of what they had done. In order to acquire a couple of towns in Lombardy, they had made the French king master of two-thirds of Italy. Consider how easily the king could have maintained his position in Italy if he had observed the rules that I had set down and become the protector and defender of his new friends. Uh, though numerous they were and timid, some afraid of the Venetians, others of the church, and thus all compelled to stick by him, and with their help he could easily have protected himself against the remaining great power. But no sooner was he established in Milan than he did exactly the wrong thing, helping Pope Alexander to occupy Romanga, part of Italy that included three of the city-states listed above. It didn't occur to him by doing that that he would be weakening himself, driving away his friends and those who had thrown themselves into his arms, while strengthening the church by adding vast political power to the spiritual power that already gives it so much authority. Having made this uh, first mistake, he was forced to deal with its consequences. To limit Pope uh, Alexander's ambition to become master of Tuscany, he had to come to Italy in person. Tuscany, a large territory uh, that includes Florence, is among his southern neighbor. And as it were enough to have made the church powerful and deprived himself of his friends, the king went after the kingdom of Naples and divided it with King Ferdinand II of Spain. Having been the chief power in Italy, he thus brought in a partner who could attract to himself everyone in the kingdom who was ambitious of his own count or dissatisfied with Louis. He could have left the king of Naples on his throne as a caretaker of his behalf, instead of which he threw them out, replacing him by someone, the king of Spain, who was capable of driving out Louis himself. So, again, like, you know, I mean, this is like a little complicated, blah, blah, blah. But he's saying that you don't make your opponents stronger. And this is something that we have to realize too that when we go into when we go into Africa, we have to when we talk about nation building, we have to talk about nation building for like within ourselves, among ourselves. Because the reality is that you're gonna have if like nation building were that easy, or whatever happens, you're gonna have whatever happens, you're going to have other African nations, as well as European nations, who are trying to 
vie for power right next to you. You know what I mean? And you do not want to make them stronger. Again, like I said, you know, I go by the term Ancopia. There are Ascari running nations today. And you do not want to make them stronger. So if we go to Africa, we establish this, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to ally with any Ascari. We don't. Because when you make the Ascari stronger, or you make the European stronger, you know, what, what you're doing is you're making yourself weaker. So it is very natural and common thing to want to acquire territory. Men do it wherever they, whenever they can. See that? We, th men do it whenever they can. And they are praised for this, or anyway, not blamed. But when they can't pull it off and yet push ahead regardless, this is a folly and they are to blame for it. If Louis could have successfully attacked Naples with his own forces, he ought to have done that. If he couldn't, then he ought to have divided it between himself and another king. Dividing Lombardy between himself and the division was excusable because it gave him a foothold in Italy, but he had no need to divide Naples, so he was at fault for doing so. Right? Alright, so Louis eliminated the minor powers, increased the strength of one of Italy's greater powers, right? Brought in a foreign power and didn't settle in the country and didn't establish colonies, but these errors wouldn't have done him any harm during his lifetime if he hadn't also deprived the Venetians of their power, if he hadn't strengthened the church or brought Spain into Italy, it would have been reasonable, even necessary to humble the Venetians. But given that he did take this uh, he didn't he did take those two other two, those other two steps, he ought never to have consented to pulling down the Venetians. As long as the Venetians remain military strong, they would have protected Lombardy from attacks from the outside. They would have permitted they would have never have permitted such an attack unless it led to their getting more territory, and no state would want to take any part of it. Lombardy from France in order to give it to the Venetians, nor would any state have had the courage to tackle both Venice and France together. If anyone objects, King Louis let the Pope have Romagna and let Spain have half of the Kingdom of Naples to avoid war. I repeat what I've already said, namely, that you should never let yourself be driven off course by your desire to avoid a war, because in such a case you won't avoid it, but will merely postpone it to your disadvantage. So King, and look at that, you see he says, go to war. Go to war. Stop postponing war. Okay? So King Louis lost Lombardy, though, through not doing any of these things that others have done when taking possession of countries and wanting to keep them. There's nothing weird or mysterious about this. It is all very reasonable and natural. During a conversation about these matters that I had in Nantes with the Cardinal of Rouen, he remarked that the Italians don't understand war, and I replied that the French don't understand politics. But it, that if they did, they wouldn't have allowed the church to become so powerful. Uh, hold on a second. Alright, so, sorry about that. Um, let's see, Machiavelli explained that this happened when Romagna was under the control of Duke Valentino as Cesar Borgia, son to Pope Alexander, was commonly called. This being an upshot to the aggrandizing of the church, Machiavelli complains of his remark to the cardinal was a warning of prediction. And so it turns out, France caused the church and Spain to become great powers in Italy, which then led to France's downfall. We can get from this the general rule, which never or hardly ever fails namely someone who someone who causes someone else to become powerful brings about 
his own ruin because it takes skill or power to do that and these attributes will be seen as threatening by the one who has benefited from them. So if you make somebody more powerful, right, they will come turn against you. All right? They'll turn against you. And this is the thing that, that, that like, you know, you can see this in your own personal life. You know, when you do help other people, uh, unfortunately, they do c turn against you uh, a lot of times. Uh, now, obviously, it's not always the case, but, you know, whatever. So why Darius's kingdom, conquered by Alexander the Great, didn't rebel against his successor after his death. So Alexander the Great conquered Asia in a few years and died before getting a proper hold on to it. Given how hard it is to hold on to newly acquired states, one might have thought, a thought that the whole territory would rise in revolt. And yet, seemingly strangely, his successors managed to hold on with no trouble except ones arising from their own ambition and mutual jealousies. Why? Here's my explanation. All the principalities of which he had, we have any record, have been governed in one or two ways. One, by a prince with the help of others whom he appoints to serve as his ministers in governing the kingdom, and whom he can dismiss at will. And B, two, by a prince together with his bar barons, whose rank isn't given to them by him, but is possessed by hereditary rights. These barons have land of their own, and subjects who recognize them as their lords and are naturally devoted to them. Where a prince rules through his servants or ministers, he has more authority because throughout the land he's the only person the people recognize as above them. If they obey anyone else, they're obeying him merely as a minister or official, and they have no special love for him. The, these two forms of government are illustrated in our own day by the Turk and the King of France. The whole Turkish Empire is governed by one lord, with everyone else who is involved in government being his servants. Dividing his kingdom into districts, he sends them different administrators whom he shifts and changes at his pleasure. The king of France is surrounded by a host of nobles with long-established hereditary titles, each acknowledged and loved by his own subjects, and each with high rank that a king can deprive him of and only at his peril. If you think about the difference between these two states, you can see that 1A... Uh, wait, what? Okay, 1A, it would be hard to conquer that of the Turks, but that once conquered, it would be easy to hold on to. Uh, hard to conquer because an invader can't be brought in by the native nobility or expect his enterprise to be helped by the defection of those whom the sovereign has around him. I explain why. It's because all those people are the prince's servants and have obligations to him, so they aren't easily corrupted, and if they are corrupted, they can't be much help because, as I explained earlier, they can't carry the people with them. So whoever attacks the Turk must reckon on fighting a united people and will have to rely on his own strength rather than on divisions on the other side. B, if an attacker overcomes the prince of a governed a country governed as Turkey is, defeating him in battle so that his armies are beyond repair, he has nothing more to worry about except for the prince's family. And once that is exterminated, there is no one else to fear. So he's saying that this is like the unitary state. You know, like I said, there's different ways to do a, a state. Uh, this is the unitary state. And the other one is the confederation. Oh, no, the federation. So uh, the unitary state would mean that the, uh, like, like, there's like a central power, you know? Uh, and you see, as they were saying, that the, the prince, uh, in the, uh, among the Turks, they had, like, everybody else, all the, all, the, all the other administrators were just servants of the prince. Whereas, uh, for France, he's going to outline, it's not that they're servants, but they are their own independent states, in a sense. You know, but they all beholden to the, the French. So, so this would be uh, what is known as a, a, a federation, you know. So the opposite of the case in the kingdom of government in the French way. You can always make inroads into such a kingdom with the help of a baron or two because there are always some who are disaffected and want change. I have already explained how much people can open the way for you to invade their country and help you to be victorious. Well, the effort to hold on to this territory will involve you in endless difficulties, problems concerning those who helped you and those whom you have overthrown. It won't be easy enough merely to destroy the prince's family because there will be barons who are ready to lead new revolts. You'll never be able to satisfy them or destroy them so you'll lose the state as soon as they see a chance to take it from you. Uh, this is important. So I, I want to say, oh yeah, there, there's like video games, like war games that white folk play. Uh, that's pretty much based off of this kind of stuff. So now if you look at the kind of government that Darius had, you'll see that it, had to that it resembled that of the Turk. So that Alexander had first to defeat him utterly and take control of his territory with no inside help. But after he had done that and Darius had died, Alexander was securely in control of the country for the reasons I have given. If his successors had stayed united, they could have enjoyed it undisturbed because the other, for the only disturbance in the kingdom came from their own infighting. 
but the kingdom organized in the French way can't be held by the conquerors as easily as that. Hence the repeated uprisings against the Romans in Spain, Gaul, and Greece, because each of these lands was divided up into many smaller principalities, from which, uh, while the memory of these uh, lasted, i.e. as long as people felt loyalty to their local baron, the Romans couldn't feel safe. But after a long period of Roman rule had erased those memories, and those extinguished those local loyal loyalties, the Roman grip became secure. It was maintained even when the Romans were warring against one another. In the infighting, each Roman governor could rely on the support of the territory he governed and the influence in, because once the families of their former prince had been wiped out, the natives had no control they could recognize except that of the Romans. If you bear all this in mind, you won't be surprised by how easily Alexander got a firm grip of Asia, but how hard it was for many other, many others, Pyrrhus, for example, to retain the territories they had conquered. Uh, this came not from these conquerors uh, differing in virtue, but from the difference in the character of the states they had conquered. So that's another thing that you want to do, is you want to analyze the different countries and the different states that you're uh, taking over. And what's, what's important to realize is that white people give you a republic, you know? Uh, they give you a republic because republics are very easy to take over, you know? Uh, or, or even like the, the different t the, the different governments that black people have, you know, a lot of reasons why they have those governments is because they're easy to take over, you know? Well, let's go. Um, yeah, we, we, like I wanted to, I kind of want to read the whole thing, and I kind of don't. So I'm going to just, you know, like I said, we can just do it on page 30 or something. But let's see, chapter 5. Uh, how to govern cities or principalities that lived under their own law before they were annexed. So when a conqueror acquires a state that has been accustomed to living under its own laws and its freedom, he has three options if he wants to hold on to this conquest. He can, and look, this is something, I want you to realize that this is important because the people who conquered Africa read this. You know what I'm saying? The people who conquered Africa studied this piece of work. Right? So you can kind of see like what the game plan is, all right? So destroy it, so one is destroy it, smash everything, go and live there himself, or let them continue with their present system of laws while paying taxes to him and setting up their small governing group who will keep the state friendly to you, okay? That's it. Such a governing group having been set up by the conquering prince will know that it can't survive without his friendly support. So it will do its best to maintain his authority. Someone who wants to retain his hold on a city accustomed to freedom will do best to get its citizens to cooperate with him. Consider the example of the Spartans and the Romans. The Spartans held Athens and Thebes, setting up a small local government in each place, yet they lost them. The Romans reduced Capia, Carthage, and Numancia to rubble, and therefore didn't lose them. They tried uh, holding on to Greece in pretty much the same way the Spartans did, allowing it to be free and to retain its own laws, and this failed. So they had to destroy a good many Greek cities in order to hold on to the territory as a whole. You see, that, see what I'm saying? He, he's, he, he, they're studying these people not because, oh, they're white, and we want to study white people because it makes us feel good. No, they're studying the Romans because they know how to, because they conquered the Greeks. Okay? They're studying, and uh, well, I mean, obviously, these are his ancestors because he's in Italy, so Rome is in, you know, whatever, but it's not, but it's like there's still a lesson there, you know? And the thing is this, too, I want you to realize this because one of the popular stories from, I think, Greece, is uh is the the story of the, the 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 trojan horse right that's not a real story that's a story from an older african story so it's just, it's just a it's just a warship it's just a war story passed down from like an older african civilization right but it's such a good ass story that they retold it in their own uh society their own community you know you have to you have to look at uh history or our story as things that can teach you on how to navigate and manage and how to win today you know you, you have ancestors who won so so you have to or ancestors who accomplish what you want to accomplish right so so you look into it so this is what th this guy's doing he's looking at his ancestors and saying they they were able to control a state all right Right, and then and then and then he's saying, hey, these people are weren't, weren't like he, you compare and contrast the failure and the success. You know, I think Malcolm X said it this way. He said, uh, anytime you see somebody doing something, like anybody doing something that you want to be doing that you're you're not doing, it's because they're doing something different from you. You know what I mean? So you got to study that difference. So the fact is that there is no way to uh, 
Uh, so, oh yeah, so in order to hold on to that. The fact is that there is no safe way to retain such a territory except by destroying it. Someone who becomes master of a city accustomed to freedom, doesn't destroy it, can expect to be destroyed by it, because in rebellions the rebels will always rally to the cry of freedom and to the old way of doing things, which are never forgotten. See that? Freedom! The old way of doing things, so they destroy a people. You, 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 look, the, 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 the Native American was never going to share land with, 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 with the United States. I mean, with the, he, he wasn't going to share land and, and be a large territory. Okay? He 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 he's going to he's going to go drink in a in a in a in a in a in a, in a reservation. It's the same with the African. The African's not going to have some independent black nation in the middle of uh, America. Okay, because 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 freedom, the cry for freedom. And again, like I said, he's not talking about you. He, I'm talking about you. He's not talking about you. He's talking about white folk. And whatever steps are taken uh, to prevent this, unless the people have fallen into disunity among themselves or have been scattered, they will always remember the label free and their old way and will rally to them at every chance they get, as Pisa did after the century of bondage to the Florentine. But when a city or country has been used to living under a prince and his family has been exterminated, the people won't be able to choose from among themselves a new prince to replace the old one. And having acquired the habit of obedience, they won't know how to live in freedom. So they'll be slow to take up arms, making it easier for an invading prince to win them over to his side. The publics, on the other hand, have more vitality, more hatred, and a stronger desire for revenge, which will never allow them to forget their former freedom, so that the safest way is to destroy them or to go and live among them. So he's saying the republics, uh, you know, are a different type of breed. Uh, chapter 6, new principalities are acquired by one's own arms and virtue. So... I'm going to be dealing with entirely new principalities, and in this discussion, I'll take the best example of a prince and a state. There's nothing surprising about this. People nearly always walk in paths beaten by others, acting in imitation of their deeds, but it's never possible for them to keep entirely to the beaten path or achieve the level of virtue of the models they're imitating. A wise man will follow in the footsteps of great men, imitating ones who have been supreme, so that if his virtue doesn't reach the level of theirs, they'll at least have a touch of it. Compare an archer aiming at a distant target. Knowing the limits of his bow's virtue, he aims high, hoping that the arrow as it descends will hit the target. So, I say therefore that an entirely new principality headed by someone who has only received recently become a prince. How much difficulty the conqueror has in keeping his new acquired state depends on how much virtue he has. The more virtue, the less difficulty. Now, he can't have risen from being a private citizen to being a prince without help from either virtue or fortuna or clearly either of those will somewhat uh, lessen the difficulty in holding on to the new state. Uh, though undue reliance on Fortuna doesn't work well in the long run. Another aid such as a new prince will have is that having no other state where he can live as a prince, he is compelled to take up residence personally in his new state. Now let us turn to the proper subject of this chapter, namely those who become princes by their own virtue and not through Fortuna. Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, Tessius, and their like are the most excellent examples. Now you see, he says Moses. Who's Moses? Right? You, you, this is why they, they, see, you read the Bible, I don't know why you read the Bible, to be honest, but they're reading the Bible for a reason. You understand? They're, they're, again, like I said, worship. It's worship. You you say worship. You read for worship, they read for worship. It's different. There's a difference. In this case of Moses, there isn't much to discuss because he simply did uh, no, I don't know why he thinks. He actually believes the story, though. That's crazy. Uh, why, you know, G, uh, where his, his, you know, his whatever. Uh, whatever. I don't know what they call him. I forgot. G, does that, G, I forgot what they call him. But anyway, told him to do. Uh, though we should admire him for being found worthy to have conversation, right? But when we look into Cyrus and others who have acquired or founded kingdoms, we'll find that they are all admirable and their actions and governing structures won't be found inferior to what Moses did on their, his great instructor. And examining their lives and their achievements, we don't find them owing anything to Fortuna beyond their initial opportunity, which brought them material to shape of what they wanted. Without the opportunity, their virtue of mind would have come to nothing, and without that virtue, the opportunity wouldn't have led to anything. For the Israelites to be willing to follow Moses, he had to find them in Egypt and slaves and oppressed by the Egyptians. For Romulus, and you see that? 
they, they make the they make the they make the black Africans the villains. But anyway, for Romulus to become king of Rome and founder of the state, he had to be abandoned at birth, which led to his leaving Alba. So Romulus, Romulus and Remus, those are the two who were raised by wolves or whatever. For Cyrus to achieve what he did, he had to find the Persians discontented with the government of the Medes, and the Medes soft and effeminate through their long peace. Now, I mean, I'm gonna just, I'm, I'm gonna quickly do a search and see if the Medes were were uh, black Africans. You know what I mean? Uh, let me see. Uh, yup, Elam. Yup. Yup, Elam were the were the were the Medes. I'm gonna show you guys. I, I just I just did a quick search, so it's not like you know, you know. Oh, he did years of research. You know what I mean? But yeah, can y'all see the top? Oh yeah, I can't see the top. Hold on a second. Let me let me just scroll up. Uh, how do I do that? Hold on a second. Just trying to display this stuff. So you know, you just sometimes just, just do your little quick search. You know, and you see it says Meads, Black Africans. That's all I searched. You know, because sometimes that's what you want. And it's like Elam. Now, if you know who the Elamites are, you know they're black. You know what I mean? So so the founding of like basically when he says the long peace, look at that. We left Elam, the Babylonians, and the Medes of Media, Greece, blah, 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 the burned faces, blah, 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 blah. Elam, the black Medes, and the Sirius. Of course, this is, it's going to be real history, WWW. I remember, I remember one of these brothers was saying, you uh, you shouldn't, you know, like, be careful with that website. You know what I mean? Uh, like, be careful with that website. So, I'm not going to, uh, oh, look at that, King Xerxes. Oh, Xerxes, that's a, I wonder if that's what we were talking about. I don't know. All right, but uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, I'm not even gonna, I'm not gonna say it's one way or the other, because like I said, the other brother was telling me, you know, watch out for that real history www. But um, now I don't know if it's a uh, something to watch out for, but I'm not even saying. So now nah, it's a Cyrus, yeah. All right, but anyway, uh, effeminate to their long peace. It's just, it's just weird for a white folk to have long peace. You know what I'm saying? All right, that's just gonna sort his virtue if he hadn't found the Athenians defeated and scattered. So these opportunities enabled those men to prosper, and their great virtue enabled each to seize the opportunity to lead his country to being noble and extremely prosperous. Now, I mean, I mean, for those of you who are wondering, hey, what would be a good book to research if you won't rely on uh, Real History WW, right? Well, try uh, When We Ruled by Robin Walker, okay? That's like one of the best history books and it's very accessible, you know, like top three history books. So try that book, or, or particularly if you're looking for like history on Asia, also try uh, Wonderful uh, Ethiopians of the Kushite Empire. That's one of those books you should read every year, you know, uh, let, to keep your mind sharp. But uh, that's uh, that, that's what I, that's what I recommend. So anyway, men like these who become princes through the exercise of their own virtue find it hard to achieve that status, but easy to keep it. One of the sources of difficulty in acquiring uh, the status of prince is their having to introduce new rules and methods to establish their government and keep it secure. We must bear in mind that nothing is more difficult to set up, more likely to fail, and more dangerous to conduct than a new system of government. Look at that. You see this? Thing? Look at this right here. Just, listen to this right here. Wait, let's just go ahead. Just, men like those who become princes through the exercise of their own virtue find it hard to achieve the status but easy to keep it. One of the sources of difficulty requiring the status of the state is to have to introduce new rules and methods to establish their government and keep it secure. So look at this. He says, this is this is for you, nation building. We must bear in mind that nothing is more difficult to set up, more likely to fail, and more dangerous to conduct than a new system of government. Because the bringer of the new system will make enemies of everyone who did well under the old system. Look at that. Everybody who did well under the old system, Right? Are not gonna want a new system. And that's what that's what I want you to understand. This is why this is partly the reason why, you know, the idea of revolution in America, where everybody's doing pretty damn good, right? Where a lot of people are pretty damn comfortable, right? A lot of people with power, a lot of people with strength, pretty damn powerful. They're not gonna want to lose all of that to you. You understand? A lot of people are not gonna want uh, a new government wh wherever they are. And this is something that you, right, now of course you know that's America, but like you go to Africa. You know, a lot of people might not want it, a new system. You know, of course, they, uh, hopefully, but that's why you have to, beforehand, you have to go in and convince people, you know, so that you don't have this kind of thing. You have to make it clear to people what it, what there is to gain, 
You know, that's what I'm working on right now. That's what I was working on before I logged on to this. You know, trying to articulate what's there to gain from... Or, I, I, at first I was saying pan African unity. Now I'm saying organizer for power. I might change it later. You know, it's just editing. If you're, you know, editing is what you do. But you have to realize that, you know, there's, there's, there, you have to convince people. Because if you don't convince people, you're going to make enemies. Right? So you will make enemies of everyone who did well under the old system. While those who may do well under this new system still won't support it warmly. Why not? Partly because of fear of the opponents who have the laws on their side, and partly because men are hard to convince of anything, and don't really believe in new things until they have long experience of them. So those who are hostile, and of course you might be talking about white folk, but it applies, okay? So those who are hostile will attack whenever they have the chance, while the others will defend so half-heartedly that they don't get the prince uh, or themselves out of danger. You know? And that's, that's something important too. Cause like like look at that look at that thing you know this is something that you have to realize like like a lot of the people a lot of times we look at our revolutionary leaders and we're like why were they betrayed by the person right next to them how did they know the person right next to them uh, was gonna betray them and it's like a lot of times you realize that the person right next to them is like yo I could benefit more I could get more if if this person wanted to speak in this nonsense you know oh yeah let's go live in huts and let's live. like you know what are you talking about I just fought a war you want me to go live in a hut nah you know what I'm saying. And, and meanwhile, there's so much wealth coming in, you know, and I can just skim off the top. Nah, you know, a lot, a lot of the people who, 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 who ended up, you know, the, the, the rulers after, like for instance, after Lumumba, I believe it was Mobutu, like he's living high on the hog. You know what I'm saying? Now, now before that, I don't know what Lumumba was telling him, but Lumumba wasn't telling him he could live that well, you know? And that's something that you have to realize that a lot of people are going to look to benefit from a new system, you know? And they're going to have the ability, and so it's, there's a lot There's a lot that you have to take into consideration. But that's why, you know, like how Machiavelli is studying his ancestors, you got to study yours. You know what I mean? you got to study yours and outline, and, and you have to be clear to the people what is, is to expect and how, and you have to you have to have some counter countermeasures for that, you know, for that situation of Mobutu, you know? But for a thorough exploration of these matters, Therefore, we have to ask concerning these innovators, these setter up of new states to carry through their projects. Must they depend on others or can they rely on themselves? That is, must they ask others for help or can they use force? If they need help, they are surely to fail and won't achieve anything. But when they can rely on themselves and use force, they aren't running much risk. That's why armed prophets always conquered and the unarmed ones have been destroyed. This is, this is a, one of my favorite quotes, matter of fact, you know, that I, I, I don't remember where it was from. But here it goes. That's why armed prophets always conquered, and the unarmed ones have been destroyed. I'm gonna I'm put that in the in the in the YouTube chat. You guys, look. If y'all see something, y'all if y'all hear something, y'all like, whether it's from me or Machiavelli, uh, you know, obviously, let me know. You know, let me know. So I'm just gonna copy and paste then. That's why armed. All right, so I, so I copied and paste. Y'all saw me copy and paste, but it, it you know I messed up the spelling, but still. Uh, that's that's it. And but, but yo, why 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 I got no likes? So, somebody drop a like. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, yeah, we're gonna keep going. Uh, remember, remember the likes help the algorithms. You know what I'm saying? The likes help the algorithms. So you know, if you if you think that what I'm ta- reading right here, or uh, how I'm reading it is valuable, then let other people know by liking the video, sharing the video, telling people come through, peep it. You know, uh, you know, make, make this one trending. You know what I mean? Make this one viral. I mean, I know it's not going to be, but still. Along with all this, uh, there is a fact that people don't stay steady. It's easy to persuade them of something, but hard to keep them persuaded. When they stop believing in their new prince, forces must be used to make them believe. The vision for doing that must be made beforehand. So he's saying, look, the most important thing, and this is why I said it, I, I said it in my book, you know? Uh, this is why I said it in my book. I said, look, warfare is, is central. Warfare is central. And this is why I want you to peep, like, get yourself the Book of Power, okay? But if you don't get the Book of Power, at least read the Pan-African Wisdom series, okay? They're freely available on the Discord, or if you go to the Warship on Sunday, just click on the link and read those things. Just read it. Try to read it every day, okay? Or at least every week, right? Read them and share them. And if you want to support this broadcast, just buy them, Okay? Uh, right now, people aren't really buying them, but you know they are so valuable because they kind of miniaturize 
the Book of Power. The Book of Power is like 600 to 500 pages, right? They're like, they're like, you know, like like two paragraphs. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so just like get yourself, or like three paragraphs, four paragraphs, I don't know, but like, like a page. They're like a page, okay? So read them, okay? You can read a page and, and you get so much from it because see this kind of stuff? All this talk is good, but this right here, it summarizes it summarizes it all. You know, it's simple. But right, let's see. If Moses, Cyrus, Theseus, and Romulus hadn't had soldiers at their command, they couldn't have enforced their constitution for long. See what happened in the other day to Father Jeramo Savalavara, who was overthrown, along with his new scheme of things, as soon as the mass of the people stopped believing in him, and he had no way of keeping steadfast those who had believed or are converting those who hadn't. Uh, a fierce Puritan and mesmerizing preacher dominated the Florence for four years when Machiavelli was an official there. So the likes of these, Moses, Cyrus, find it hard to reach their goal because there is a great danger of the way up through their virtue will enable them to overcome it. But when this has been done and the danger is past and those who resented their success have been exterminated, they'll begin to be respected and they will continue afterwards powerful, secure, honored, and happy. You see what I'm saying? And that's another thing too. Like, like that's something that, that, that and this is something that you have to understand too. If people, if Mobutu understood that people would have killed him for killing Lumumba, they probably wouldn't have done it. You know what I'm saying? If the dude next to Sankara understood that that if 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 the, if the war was if the if the army was set up such that the people second to him, right, were were assigned to to do the, the dirty work, or like all the army was assigned to do the dirty work in the event of, you understand? That would have been different. Now of course you know. Obviously, there's countermeasures to that, too. Obviously, you know, he'd be like, well, you know, he'll execute all the whole army. So I don't know what he can do. But the point being that you have to, you know, and now they're not really talking about that per se right here. But that's something that you have to, like, we have to think about for our own people. Okay? We have to think about for our own people in the future, you know? If, if, if things are going well with me, and that's another thing, too. I want you to, you got to think about what he just said, you know? If if these these people didn't have soldiers at their command, you know, when we talk about being a nation builder, we have to have soldiers at our command. So you gotta say to yourself, are you gonna be a soldier or are you gonna be a commander? Okay? If you're talking about nation building, do you wanna be a soldier or do you wanna be a commander? And if you are if you wanna be a soldier, who's your commander? And if you're a commander, where are your soldiers? Okay? Because that's what it takes to be a nation builder. Okay, the Constitution has to be has to. Y'all don't even know. Y'all 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 like like you you listening, but you ain't listening, right? You listening, but you ain't listening. Cause look, I still got zero likes, so I know you ain't listening. You know what I mean? <laughs> All right. A fifth example is not on the same level as the other four, but this case is somewhat like this, and I bring it in as a stand-in for all the other cases. They are like, I am referring to hero the Syracuse or whatever, uh, from. Oh, Syracuse, okay. Syracuse. From being an ordinary citizen, this man rose to the prince of Syracuse, and he, like the others, owed nothing to fortune except the opportunity in a time of military threat. The Syracuse the Syracusans chose him to head their troops. Afterward they rewarded him by making him their prince. He was of such great virtue, even as an ordinary citizen, that someone wrote of him that he had everything he needed to be a king except the kingdom. He abolished the old army and established a new one, gave up old alliances and made new ones. And that gave him the foundation, his own soldiers, his own allies, on which he could build anything he wanted to build. Thus, it was very hard for him to acquire something, to lose the power that he had little trouble holding on to. Uh, so the new principality is acquired by the arms of Fortuna of others. Those who are raised purely by Fortuna, uh, from being private citizens to being princes, don't have much trouble rising, just floating up. But well, they find it hard to stay up there. I'm referring to men whom a state is given, as happened to many in Greece, in the cities of Ionia and the Hellespont, where Darius enthroned princes who were holding the cities in the interest of the security and glory, and to men who brought, bought their states, rising to the rank of emperor through the corruption of the soldiers. Uh, in, in 193 CE, the Praetorian Guard in Rome murdered the emperor, and then put the city and its empire up for auction. What the freak? A man named Julianus made the winning bid that was designated as emperor and lived in rule for 66 days. Okay. Uh, that's crazy. So, so somebody, somebody murdered the emperor and then, and then put the city for auction. That's crazy. All right. 
So such people in category, that's two months of being an emperor. I don't know what happened after that. That's why I figured that the story. Such people in category, and that's what I'm saying. You see the diversity of the stories, and and that's something that like history. You, you understand history records thousands and thousands of years. So you can find interesting examples if you just look. You know what I mean? If you just look, uh, as opposed to whatever you're doing, which is you know, what like whatever you're doing. I don't know what you're doing. So like a lot of people are focusing on video games with their fake stories. You know what I mean? Like like the lessons are there. But they're not real lessons that real people went through, you know. So you could you could play Call of Duty and you could get a bunch of lore from Call of Duty, or, or you could even play like a Lord of the Rings or whatever, Dragon Age or whatever, right? You could play something with its lore and its own backstory and you know blah blah blah. But they're not real stories, as opposed to with history, they are real stories. You know what I mean? Or or even if they're not real, real, you know what I mean? Because sometimes a lot of stuff are also embellished. You know what I mean? But notwithstanding, there's some lesson there. Uh, such people in category A especially depend entirely on two extremely unreliable and unstable things, namely the support and the fortune of whoever raised them by the status of prince. So the person would have either the knowledge or the power to keep his position. Uh, won't have either the knowledge or the power to keep his position. Knowledge, and that's the same. You, you need the knowledge to keep your position. If you're trying to become uh, you know, a ruler in Africa, you have to study. Knowledge, unless he has extremely high level of ability and virtue, he can't be expected to know how to command, having always lived an ordinary citizen. Power, he won't have an army. Power, he won't have an army, and he can rely on to be friendly and loyal. Uh, states that come into existence suddenly, like everything in nature, and is born and grows fast, can't have roots and connections that will save them from being blown down by the first storm, unless, I repeat, the suddenly elevated prince has so much virtue that he knows he must immediately set to work to make sure of his hold on what fortune I have given him. Lay the foundation of that another leader might have laid before becoming a prince rather than afterwards. Uh, and this is, what I, this, is why, this is why I say it's so important because it's like, this is what happened inside of Africa. This is what happens, you know, like throughout the world where it's like, you know, one of the, one of the videos that I really liked back in the day was this uh, video where these people were asking the people of Kenya, right, whether they were ready to rule or should they take a little longer. Like Brittany was asking, and a lot of people were saying, no, we're not ready yet, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, like, me looking outside, I'm just like, that's some stupid, sh like, why would you say that? But it's a real concern of whether you are ready to uh, rule, you know? Like, 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 a lot of people are like, hey, you know, if Africa, you know, if America collapses, then we're going to have something. What are you going to have? You're not ready to rule. You don't, you don't have any sort of self-governance as it is. And the people who have the largest influence, right, are, are grifters, you know, are grifters. So, so what you'll have is that, you know, let's say America does collapse. You'll have Tariq Nasheed say, oh, we're taking over this country, right? And then he's there just working with these white folks, you know. But, but a, lot of more, a lot more black people are going to go to Tariq Nasheed than they're going to go to you because you ain't even established yourself. You understand? So, so you're going to be living in Tariq Nasheed's country. Or you're going to be living in uh, Yvette Carnell's country. You understand? Know uh, but basically, you're not going to gain from this. Because nobody is, is really preparing to be the self-governing people that they allegedly want to be. Right? So I'll illustrate these two ways of becoming a prince. So virtue and through fortuna. By uh, considering two examples from our own time. Namely, uh, and look, Cesare Borgia, I think that's the guy they allegedly say is the model for Jesus, right? But I don't know. Namely, Francesco Savorza. Oh, hold on a second. Did I switch back? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, namely, uh, Francesco Savorza and uh, uh, Savorza and Cesare Borgia. By choosing the appropriate means and with great virtues, Savorza went from being a commoner to being a duke of Milan, and he hadn't much trouble holding on to the power and it cost him so much effort to get in the first place. Uh, in contrast to that, Cesare Borgia Coming out as Duke Valentino, acquired his state through the fortune of his father, Pope Alexander VI. And when his father died, he lost it despite having taken every measure that a wise and virtuous old man should take to give himself firm foundations of state in the army and fortune of someone else had given him. Someone who didn't lay his foundations before achieving power may be able with great virtue to lay them afterwards, but that will involve trouble for the architect and danger to the building. If we look carefully at everything Borgia did, we'll see that he did lay solid foundations for his future power. I think it's worthwhile to discuss his effort because I don't know of any 
better advice to give a new prince than follow the example of Sir Borgia. His arrangements failed, but that wasn't because of any fault of him, but because of the extraordinary and extreme hostility of Fortuna. Uh, Alexander the Sixth, so he's saying that he, he's going to learn from this failure, you know, because the failure did, did, did well. So that's another thing, too. It's like you can also do well and still fail. That, that's, that's the reality, obviously. Alexander the Sixth, wanting to achieve greatness for the Duke, his son, faced many obstacles present in the future. Firstly, he didn't see how he could make him master of any state that wasn't a part of the Turkish territory, and he knew that if he sold land to the Turks, the Duke of Milan and the Venetians wouldn't consent to that. Furthermore, he saw that the mercenary armies in Italy, especially those that might have helped him, were in the hands of rulers who had reason to fear his growing power, namely the Orsani and the Karzani clans and their allies. What he had to do then was to upset his state of affairs and create turmoil in the state of the rivals, so as to get away with seizing control of part of them. This was easy for him to do because he found the Venetians, for reasons of their own, were trying to bring the French back into Italy, and the Pope, far from opposing this, made it easier to bring about by dissolving his former marriage with King Louis. So the French king came into Italy with Venetian help and the Pope's consent. No sooner was the king in possession of Milan than he supplied the Pope with the supply soldiers for the attempt on Lamagna, uh, Remag- which yielded to him because he had the support of the king. The Pope's son, Cesar uh, Bergia, Duke Valentino, was commander of the Pope's army. Uh, the, the Duke, having acquired the line and beaten the Colonel family, wanted to hold on to the and to advance further, but he was hindered by two things. His suspicion of the army wasn't loyal to him, and he was worried about the attitude of France. He was afraid of the forces of Arsini uh, family, which he had been using, would stop obeying his orders and not only block him from winning more territory, but even take for themselves what he had already won. And his fears about the French king were pretty much the same. His doubts about the Arsini soldiers were confirmed. When after Fazani had been taken, he saw how half-heartedly they went into the attack on Bologna, uh, Bologna, right? Anyway, and he learned which way King Louis was leaning when he, Cesare Borgia, went on from taking the Duchy of Livorno to attack Tuscany, and the king made him turn back. This led him to the decision never again to allow the arms of Fortuna or anyone else. So this was actually I probably should skip over this because this is just about the history. Uh, now, obviously, I say history is valuable, but you know, usually. You know, it's better to just look at the lessons at, at some point. You know? Uh, hold on a second. Looks like somebody typed something. Uh, Alright, he began by weakening, he began by weakening the Barsini, uh, he began by weakening the Barsini and the Kalana factions in Rome by winning over to his side all these supporters who were gentlemen, making them his gentlemen. Uh, paying them well and giving them military command or uh, governmental positions, each according to his rank. So he's saying the lords, like I said, the barons and all that stuff. Within a few, or even like servants, right, whatever. Within a few months, they were all cut off from their former factions and entirely attached to the duke. Remind that this is Duke Valentino equal to Sarah Borgia, right? So he's just letting me know. Where's my mind? Okay. Uh, in this way, he scattered the Kalana family's adherents, and then he waited for an opportunity to crush the Arsini. This came to him soon, and he used it well. The Arsini had at last come to realize that the growing power of the Duke and the Church would be their ruin. So they came together for a planning uh, meeting at Margian near Perugia. This gave rise to a rebellion at Urbino and riots in Romagna, which, uh, with endless dangers to the Duke, all of which he overcame with the help of the French. Having restored his credibility and not wanting to rely on the French or any others outside forces to preserve it, he resorted to trickery. He was so good at concealing his attention that he got the city to be willing to be reconciled with him. His intermediary in the process was Paolo Morsini, whom the Duke reassured with all the sorts of courtesy, the sorts of courtesy money, clothes, and horses. Their city was so naive that they went at his invitation to say Sinigralia, where they were in his power. In a separate essay that wasn't published until after his death, Machiavelli describes in detail how Cesare Borgia went about murdering the top peoples of the Arsini faction, including Paolo Arsini and Aleravato and Fremo, with, of whom we shall hear more on page 18. By exterminating the Arsini leaders and making allies of their supporters, the Duke laid solid foundations of his power, having all of Romagna and Duchy of Urbina in his grip, and he won the peeps sword of the people who were beginning to appreciate the prosperity brought them by his rule. So that's to say, this is important right here, this is probably the, last, the most important thing. He won the support of the people who were beginning to appreciate the prosperity brought by his rule. You see what I'm saying? Uh, so, you know, 
at the end of the day, that's what you're supposed to do when you're trying to organize in Africa, which is just bring prosperity. That's it. Just bring prosperity. All right, so I want to spend a little bit of uh, longer on this last matter because it is important and deserves to be intimidated, imitated by others. When the Duke occupied Rwanda, he found it under the rule of weak masters who preferred robbing their subjects to governing them. See what I'm saying? A lot of people, that's what, that's what happens in Africa. They preferred robbing their subjects to governing them, okay? And gave them more cause for dissension than for unity, with the result that the territory was full of robbery, feuds, and every kind of lawlessness. One to restore peace and obedience to authority, the Duke thought he had to give in some good government. And to that end, he gave complete control to Romarco, blah, 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 a man who always acted decisively and ruthlessly. It didn't take long for this man to restore peace and unity, getting a considerable reputation for himself. But the Duke came to think that extreme severity was going to make him hated by the populace, so he set up a single court of judgment for the whole of Ramagna, a court with a most excellent presiding judge to whom all the cities could send their advocates. He knew that Diorco's uh, severity had caused such hatred against himself and wanted to clear that out from the minds of the people and win them over to himself. So he set out to show that if there had been any cruelty, its sources were not him, but rather the brutal nature of his minister. At the, very opportun at the first opportunity, he had a Diorco arrested and cut in two, then beheaded, uh, leaving the pieces on the piazza at Cesara at the block and a bloody knife beside it. This brutal spectacle gave the people a jolt, but it also reassured them. But now back to my main theme. Borgia had acquired an army of his own and had pretty much destroyed the armies of the vicinity that could make trouble for him, so that now his power was consolidated and he was fairly well secured against immediate dangers, and he saw that if he wanted to conquer more territories, he needed the support of the King of France, which he knew he couldn't get because the king had belatedly come to realize that it was a mistake to ally himself uh, with Cesare Borgia. So he began to seek new alliances and to hang back from the helping France against the Spaniards in the French attempt to conquer the Kingdom of Naples. His intention was to make himself secure against the French, and he would quickly have brought it, this all off if his father, Pope Alexander, hadn't died a few months later. That's how Borgia handled his immediate problems. For the longer term, he had to prepare for the possibility that Alexander VI might be succeeded by a pope who wasn't friendly to him and might try to take back from him the territory that Alexander had given him. For this purpose, he made four plans to exterminate the families of the lords he had dispossessed so as to deprive the pope of that excuse for interfering, two, to win the gentlemen of Rome over to his side so as to have their help in hemming the Pope in, and to increase the control of the College of Cardinals with which uh, which could elect the next Pope, and four, to acquire as much territory as he would quit while Pope Alexander was alive, so that as be well placed to resist with his own resources any attack by the new Pope. By the time Alexander died, the Duke had managed three out of the four. He had killed, one, killed as many of the dispossessed lords as he could lay hands on, which was most of them, uh, two, won over the Roman gentlemen, and three, brought onto his side a large majority of the College of Cardinals, right? Uh, uh, and for four further conquests, he planned to become master of Tuscany. Thus, he already held Perugia and Piambio and Pisa while well, under his protection. He no longer had to fear anything from the French direction because the Spaniards had robbed France of the Kingdom of Naples so that both sides had to buy his support. So he felt free to pounce down on Pisa. When he had done that, the Luca and Siena would immediately capitulate, partly out of fear and partly out of hostility to the Florentines, and the Florentines couldn't have done anything about it. If Cesare really had achieved all this, and he was almost there when Alexander died, he would have acquired so much power and prestige that he could have stood on his own feet, relying solely on his own power and virtue, and not on the fortune and military power of anyone else. But Alexander did die, a mere five years after his son had first drawn the sword. The Duke's condition at the time was this. He had firm control over Magna. His, all, his other planned conquests were up in the air. He was caught between two powerful hostile armies. He was mortally ill. This illness which he survived was the same one that had just killed his father, Pope Alexander. But the Duke had so much ferocity and virtue and understood so well that men may, must be either won over or killed and had in a short time available laid some firm foundation. And you see how they just kill people. You see how they just kill people. This is something that you have to realize that this is again this is not it's not black people. It's not quote unquote racism. This is they just kill people. You either kill people or win them over. And and the truth is that this 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 is what it is. Okay? This is what this is what they encourage among their people. Either either win people over or kill them. Okay? And then you're surprised that you're you're you, you know that that you know that, that that white folk trying to win you over. And if they're not trying to win you over, they're killing you. How, how are you surprised about that? Like, like, please explain that to me. 
you know, like they said, uh, you know, you know, like they said, you know, drop some comments, you know, drop a comment about how are you surprised about that. The book showed me the house and word problem is deeply rooted and very hard to solve. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. All right, the house Negro problem, because it's like they understand that either you win people over or you kill them. You know, that's how you rule. That's how that's how they know to rule. That's the only way they. That's that. This is this is called the optimal way of ruling to them. You know. Sorry about. All right. Anyway, so let's see. Uh, had a short time available. Laid such firm foundation that he would have surmounted every obstacle in the French and Spanish armies had it been beating uh, bearing down on him, or if he had been in good health. It's clear the foundations he had laid were indeed solid. For Rolando waited for him to for more than a month, and he was safe in Rome. Although half dead, the Baglioni, Vitelli, and Orsini factions came to Rome, but couldn't stir things up against him. If he had been in good health when his father died, he would have managed everything easily, for example. He couldn't have dictated who would be the next pope, but he could have blocked the election of any candidate he didn't want. On the day that Julius II was elected as a pope, the duke himself told him that he had thought of all the problems that might occur when his father died, and had... Uh, solutions for them all, except that it hadn't occurred to him that when his father died, he himself would be at death's door. Having set out all the Duke's action, I can't find anything to criticize. Indeed, he seems to me, I repeat, to be a model for anyone who comes to power through Fortuna and with help from arms of others. A model, although he failed, yes, because his great courage and highly ambitions uh, wouldn't have allowed him to act differently from well, how he did. And he failed only because his father's life was so so short and he himself was so ill. So a new ruler would think he has to... And this is what I'm saying. So this is what I'm saying. Look, he's saying this is a model. The model is be a freaking genocide, like be a murderer, like kill all the elites. You know, when, look, secure himself in a new principality. You know, you go to Africa, secure yourself in a new principality. Win friends. Overcome obstacles either by force or fraud. Make himself loved and feared by the people. Be followed and respected by his soldiers. Exterminate potential enemies. Replace all laws by new ones. Be severe and gracious, magnanimous and liberal. Break up a disloyal army and create a new one. Maintain friendships with kings and princes so that they must openly help him or be very careful about harming him. Can't find a livelier example than the actions of this man. The only thing he can do to criticize for the election of Julius II as the Pope, a bad choice. As I've already said, the Duke wasn't in a position to decide who would be the new Pope, but he could block the election of anyone he didn't want, and he ought never to have allowed the election of any cardinal whom he had injured or who as Pope would have reason to fear him. Men harm one another either from fear or from hatred. The cardinal he had harmed included, among others, the cardinal of, Sa of San Petro, Pietro ad Vincula, and the Carl of San Giorgio and Alfonso Bolivar. The first Carl of the list is, is the one who became Pope Julius II. So, and each of these other Carl's had reason to fear him if he became Pope, except for the Carl of Rouen and Spanish Carl's. Uh, Machiavelli gives reasons for these exceptions then. So the Duke's first choice for Pope should have been one of the Spanish Cardinals failing with uh, the Carl of Rouen and not the Carl of San Pietro and Vincula. So that's this. Uh, anyone who thinks that the new benefits will cause great men to forget old injuries is wrong. Borgia miscalculated his papal election, and this that error was fatal. So, uh, and again, this is the thing that you have to realize, too, that, you know, this is this is human history. Well, all right, like, European history. Like, this guy, if he, if Borgia survived, you probably would have seen another country on the map today. You know what I mean? Like, not Italy, but, like, another country. Like, could it be Borgia? You know, Borgia, whatever. Right? You could have had a whole other country, but but because he didn't survive, blah blah. blah. And again, his 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 you know workings, you know whatever, could have chose the, this this pope. Now I don't know who this pope is, obviously, uh, it, it, but but it might have been significant in the history of of Europe, you know. And that's the thing that, that that's that's real life. This is real life. That you know, real life nation building is that you're going to be making these kind of decisions, you know. Uh, real life nation building is that let's say the African Union of the future is is in need of a uh, of a of a new you know founding like a new director right you're gonna have a say in it if you were a true nation builder you understand or if, if, if and, and that's if the AU is still around but but that's that's what I'm telling you it's like or even the the, the United Nations you could have a say in it let's say if you want to join the United Nations or whatever like like there is so much that 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 like real life that we we can do we can accomplish if we just go for it 
You understand? If we just go for it and we say, let's work together. Because again, like, like, like I, I tell you and I emphasize, I tell you in the, in the book of power, I tell you, nothing works in theory. All that works, works in works. So we have to come together. Okay? We have to work together. Come on. All right. So let's go. Chapter 8. Principality obtained through wickedness. So of the ways in which a private person can rise to be a prince, there are two ways that I... That, aren't entirely matters of fortune or virtue. I can't pass them by in silence, though I shan't deal with them as fully as I would in a book about republics. There are these. Someone raises himself to be a prince through some really wicked conduct. This will be the topic of the present chapter. A citizen becomes the prince of his country by the support of his fellow citizens. I'll discuss this in chapter 9. So the treatment of the first of this will consist in presenting two examples, one ancient and one modern. The other modern, without going into the merits of such a procedure. The two examples, I will think, will provide enough instruction for anyone who has to go that way. Angos was a Sicilian who, and see, he, he calls this ancient. The the, you know, this is a Sicily, Sicily or whatever. Oh snap, Hamilcar. Uh oh, this is Carthage. Okay, all right. So, <laughs> Agathocles was a Sicilian who, starting not merely as an ordinary citizen, but as a very low class one, uh, his father was a potter, became king of Syracuse. All right, he was a scoundrel. Give me two seconds. I'm trying to. He was a scoundrel uh, from the day he was born, but he accompanied his families. But he accompanies his infamies with so many virtues of mind and body that, having joined the Syracusan army, he rose to his ranks to be a commander in chief. Being established in that position, he decided to become Syracuse's uh, prince and to use force, with no help from anyone else, to hold on to the power that he had been given to them and to upgrade it to the power of a prince. He discussed his plans with Hamilcar, a Carthaginian uh, who army was at the time fighting in Sicily. This was not the fa oh, phew, my, my bad. This was not the famous uh, Hamilcar, father of Hamil Hannibal, who led the first Carthaginian war against Rome a few decades later. So it's not, it's not, it's not. My bad. I'm getting hyped for nothing. All right. <laughs> I don't know why I'm mad. I don't know why this dude had to decide to put this here. You know when I was getting hyped. All right. Then one morning he assembled the people and the Senate of Syracuse, and if he had public affairs to discuss with them and. At an agreed signal, his soldiers killed all the senators and the richest of the people. And with that out of the way, Agatha seized and held the principalities of that city without any trouble from the people. And although the Carthaginians routed him twice and eventually laid siege to Syracuse, he was able not only to defend the city, but also able to attack some of his to, to take some of his men to attack Africa. And before long, the the siege of Syracuse was lifted, and the Carthaginians and the end of their tether were compelled to come to terms with Agathlis, uh leaving Sicily to him and settling for the possession of Africa. If you study the action and the career of this man, you'll see little, if anything, that could be attributed to Fortuna. He became a prince, as we have just seen, not through anyone's favor, but by steadily rising in the military profession. Uh, oh, this is, this is, he's talking about a coup. This is a coup. Uh, each promotion uh, involving countless difficulties and dangers, and once he had his principalities to be held on to, he held on to it boldly through many hostilities and dangers. And you won't see anything you could attribute to virtue either, for it cannot be called virtue to kill one's fellow citizens, to deceive friends, and to be without uh, faith or mercy or religion. Such methods may bring power, but won't bring glory. Machiavelli's next sentence, so he says, uh, because if we consider Agalothi's virtue in confronting and surviving dangers and his courage in enduring and overcoming hardships, there's no present reason for judging him to be inferior to the most successful military leaders. <laughs> so as for Agalothi's abilities to confront and survive dangers and his courage in enduring and overcoming uh, hardships, if they are considered a virtue, then there is no reason to admire him as much as the most successful military leaders. But his barbarous cruelty and humanity with infinite wickedness do not permit him to be celebrated among the most excellent men, and therefore it isn't right to count him his striking attributes as virtue. So summing it up, what he achieves can't be attributed either to fortune or virtue. So so basically what he's saying is that like like basically back in the day there was also coups. You know, even there's, there's coups in ancient history. And a coup is basically when you just seize the government. Like you, you, you rise up, you know, quiet, you know, Matter of fact, like, if you look at The Lion King, you know the movie. And, you know, some people say that it's based off of a uh, older son, like Sunjata. You know, it's based off of Sunjata, who was also known as The Lion King. But, um, yeah, actually, yeah, it kind of is. So, so, anyway, but, all right, so in The Lion King, you know, I think Scar is the brother of Mufasa. And and eventually he he, uh, he leads a coup. He, he allies with the hyenas, and he leads a coup against the... Uh, 
against the uh, against Mufasa uh, against Simba and them. You know, Simba basically dies or what? I don't know. Whatever. I don't remember. But here's the thing that happens in Sunjata. Matter of fact, Sunjata. Now I want to say I don't know how. I mean, I can't really see the. It's kind of parallel. I don't know. But <laughs> but like Sunjata leads the coup against uh, the evil emperor, right? So Sunjata Sunjata leads the coup against the evil emperor, and he he gets allies from across Africa. And establishes this new uh, Mali Empire. So, so I mean, but of course, he, his is more like virtuous in the sense that he's going against these other people who are who are also like like the enemy in the story of Sanjata uh, has like the Arab allies. You know what I mean? So it's it's a really it's a really interesting story. And that's why I say you you want to sit down and study and learn from it. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's riddled with stories of magic though. So or the la the la the right but you know notwithstanding like you know taking out that aspect the supernatural aspect you know like transforming into animals going invisible uh you know growing into size you know uh you take out those stuff and then you you really have like a story of you know uh of like nation building you know and that's that's what i'm saying like you you gotta just pick up the examples of our of our past so anyway this is a this is a example from uh machiavelli's past though in our times during the papacy of Alexander the Sixth, Olerato da Fermo, uh, having been left an orphan many years before, was brought up by his maternal uncle Giovanni Foglini, and when still young, he was sent to serve as a soldier under Paolo Vitelli, so that he could get some training that would enable him to have a successful military career. After Paolo died, he served under Paolo's brother, Vitellozzo, and before long, his resourcefulness and strength of body and mind made him Vitellozzo's top officer. Uh, but we had no enthusiasm for serving along with others, and therefore under someone else's command. So he decided to seize Fermo with Vitellazzo's support and help from some citizens of, to whom the to, to Fermo to whom the slavery of their country was dearer than its freedom. Right? He wrote to his uncle Giovanni Foglani to the following effect: Having been away from home for many years, he wanted to visit his uncle and his city and to have a look at the land his father had left him. He hadn't worked to acquire anything except honor, and so couldn't return home with an ostentatious display of wealth. But he returned to, but he wanted to return in style, so that the citizens should see he had been wasting his time in the military, so he would be accompanied by a hundred of his friends and servants, all on horseback. And he asked Giovanni to have the Fermians receive him with a suitable ceremony to honor not only himself, but also his uncle and guardian Giovanni. Giovanni ensured that his nephew received every courtesy. Uh, he caused him to be ceremoniously received by the Fermians and lodged him in his own house. After some days there, making the needed arrangements for his wicked plan, Alevrato laid on a grand banquet to which he invited Giovanni Fagliani and a top man of Fermo. When the eating was over and all the other entertainments that are usual in such banquets were finished, Alevrato cunningly began some solemn talk about the greatness of Pope Alexander and his son Caesar and of their enterprises. Uh, that's, the, that's the people from the other story. Giovanni and other joined in the conversation, but Alarbato suddenly stood up and said that such matters should be discussed in one private place, and he went into another room with Giovanni and the other citizens following him. No sooner were they seated than soldiers emerged from hiding places and slaughtered them all, Giovanni included. After his massacre, Alarbato and his followers mounted on horseback and sped through the town to the palace of the governor. They laid siege to the palace, so frighteningly the governor that he was forced to obey him and form a government of which he, Alavato, made himself the prince, having killed all the dissidents who might hit back at him. He strengthened his position with new rulers, rules and regulations governing civil and military matters, so that in this one year as prince in Fermo, he had not only made himself secure within the city, but also came to be feared by all his neighbors. He would have been as difficult to destroy as Aglathus was if he hadn't, as I reported earlier, allowed himself to be deceived by Caesar Borgia, who netted him along with the Arsini and Vitelli at Tanagra, where one year after the massacre he was strangled together with Vitellizzo, whom he had made his leader in virtue and wickedness. Some may wonder how a man like Agathalus, after countless treacheries and cruelties, could live for years secure in his country and defend himself from external enemies and never be conspired against by his own citizens, seeing that many others who have also used cruelty haven't been able to hold on to the ruling position in peacetime, let alone in an insecure time of war. And of course, you know, like I said, in Africa, we have tons of these kind of uh, cruel leaders, these cruel coup cool leaders who, who hold on to power for a long time. You know, they hold on to power for a long time. Uh, and I, I mean, I was recently informed about one of the uh, 
people who disrupted the whole federation of Nigeria and was able to hold on to and like extort and exploit uh, the people of Nigeria for a long time. Uh, but that's what I'm saying. But like he says, I believe that it depends on whether cruelty is employed well or badly. Cruel acts are used well if we can apply well to wicked acts, if they are needed for political security and are all committed at a single stroke and then discontinued or turned into something that is to take advantage of, that is to the advantage of the subject. See, and that's what I'm saying. That's not even the case. Cruel acts are badly... So that's not, that's not the case. Because I, I tell you, there's a video... There are a couple of videos coming from like these military occupations in Africa today, right? Where like the cruelest things you could see. Like I, I saw this video of a woman running naked She's, I think she's being beaten first, and then they just shoot her, and then they shoot her dead body, like, 30 times, you know? Or there was the video of, you, you, I think you might have also seen this one, where they shoot uh, two mothers with the babies on their backs. They line them up, and they execute these, these mothers with the babies on their backs. And, 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 and this is something that's happening today, and it's not like, oh, it just happened one time. So let's see what the other example is. So cruel acts are badly used when, even if they are few of them at the outset, their numbers grow through time. Those who practice the first system may be able to improve somewhat their standing in the eyes of a man as Agus did. Those who follow the two other can't possibly maintain themselves. So he's saying, yeah, cruel acts are badly used when, even if they are a few of them at the outset, their numbers grow through time. So this is what's happening in Africa, the second, the latter. And and that's something that you have to understand and, and you know, like like you said, the neighbors are gonna be fearful. Feared by their neighbors. You know, you have to realize that if if they're shooting their own citizens, you know, who are you? You know what I mean? Like who are you? They're shooting their own like they're shooting defenseless women. Right? Who are you? Uh, a, a man trying to uh well, if you're a man, but you know, a man or a woman trying to uh, uh seize the state, you know, trying to trying to control something. You know, when, when when they won't even like they don't even dignify, you know, like like defenseless women, naked women. You know what I mean? So someone who is seizing a state, and this is like, and when I say the woman was executed like that, it's like five soldiers, ma like machine guns, you know, killing a, di a naked woman while she cries and walks. You know, so someone who is seizing a state should think hard about all the injuries he'll have to inflict and get them all over with at the outset rather than having cruelty as a daily occurrence. And it's something that, you know, like our people don't do. By stopping cruelty very soon, the usurper will be able to reassure people and win them over to his side by generosity. Someone who doesn't proceed in this way, whether from fear or on bad advice, will always have to have a knife in his hand. And he won't be able to rely on his subjects who will be alienated by his continued and repeated injuries. And so this is what, this is what you see in Africa. They, they, a lot of the leaders have knives in their hands all the time. You know, above all things, a prince ought to relate to his people in such a way that nothing that happens, good or bad, will make him change his course. In troubled times, you won't be able to fix the troubles by moving towards greater harshness, because it will be too late for them for that. Nor will it help for you to move in the direction of greater mildness, because that will seem to have been compelled, and you'll get no credit for it. So, civic principalities. So, I mean, like I said, I try to go to page 30 right here. You see, this is 24 out of 59. I'm trying to go to 30, maybe end the chapter there, right? Uh, but, you know, so it's just six more pages. But thanks so much, everybody, for bearing with me. Like I said, you know, try to drop some more likes, you know? Uh, brother says I need a headphone mic. Wait, you guys can't hear me? Can you, hello, testing? You guys can't hear me? Uh, all right. I, I'm holding the control right now. I'm holding the mic right now. But it's like a webcam. But I keep, I keep dropping it on the floor. Maybe that might <laughs> might be a problem. You know what I'm saying? Uh, anyway. But all right. Let's see. Chapter 9. Civic Principalities. Uh, at the start of a Chapter 8, I spoke of two ways of becoming a prince that aren't entirely matters of fortune or virtue. Uh, and now I come to the second of them. A citizen becomes the prince of his country, not by wickedness or any intolerable violence, but by the favor of his fellow citizens. We can call this civil principalities. Uh, Machiavelli adds in parentheses that what you need to become a civil prince is just una astuza fortuna, a fortunate or happy or lucky cleverness or astuteness. What you don't need, he says, is atua de virtue of whatever. A phrase that has given trouble to translators. Here are four published translations of it. Nor is a genius of fortune altogether necessary to attain to it. The prince doesn't have to depend wholly on skill or fortune. He, you don't have to be wholly brilliant or extraordinarily luckily. Uh, it is not necessary to have one abil only ability and only good luck. So, I got it. Take your pick. Machiavelli continues. Uh, basically, I mean, I'll just say it like this. You know, if you're... Like, he's saying if you're, if the, if you're fellow citizen. So, like, basically, like I said, we, we, we go about... We go about and we do some nation building. Who's going to be the leader? Okay? 
right? Now, obviously, most people are not going to select me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so if it's not me, you know, uh, it's going to be somebody. Most of us don't know who it is. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so it's like, it's like if one of us is going to be the leader, right, assuming that that's the case, right, you know, one of us becomes this uh, prince. Now, of course, you know, we might set up a republic, we might just vote, all that stuff. But if, but if it's not that, then, of course, you know, because uh, he's saying it's our principality. So let's say that it's, it's going to be like one and done. You know what I mean? So it's going to be one election, and then it's going to be, that's it, right? So who do you choose? And it's like, it's not entirely, he's saying it's not entirely based off of your skill. It's not entirely based off of luck, but it's like a, a mixture between the two. You know what I mean? Uh, anyway, so, uh, so yeah, yeah, so it's like, that's what it is. So it's like, take your pick and say that it's not, it's not, it's neither, it's neither, it's neither either or, but it's, it's something, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, to be the selected as the leader or, or, or the, the, the beginning of the dynasty, right, uh, you know, is, is, is nothing is nothing small, but it's but you just got to be like the best of the, you know, you got to be the best of the lot. It's kind of like, you know, I, I don't want to talk about it, but yeah. All right, now this kind of principality, this way of becoming a prince is obtained with the support of the common people or with the support of the nobles. Every city-state has common people who don't want to be ruled or ordered around by the nobles, and nobles who do not want, who do want to rule and order around the common people. And the conflict between the two opposite political drives results in each city in one of three things: a civil principality, freedom, or ungoverned chaos. Whether a civil principality is created by the people or by the nobles uh, depends on which group has the opportunity. When the nobles see that they can't resist popular pressure, they uh, Select one of their number, praise him to the skies, and make him a prince. So here's the thing that I want you to understand. So this is what, one of the things that I break down inside of my book, which is that there are two types of people. There are the elites and the commoners. And no, there's three types of people. The elites, commoners, and the kings. Okay? The the Nesut. All right? Now, the Nesut, the king, and you see, you see, you see he's laying out how this happens, right? So one of the elite becomes the Nesut. You know what I'm saying? But but basically the elite are the center of the nation, because because the, uh, the the commoners the commoners need like 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 they're gonna be ruled. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's the ruled and the ruling. No, the ruled and the the rulers. You know, hoping to be able to under his shadow uh, to get what they want. When the people find that they can't resist the nobles, they select one of their number, pays him the cat, and make him a king hoping that his authority will be a defense for them. Someone who becomes a prince with the help of the nobles will find it hard to maintain his position because he'll be surrounded by men who regard themselves as his equal, which will inhibit him in giving orders and managing affairs. It is easier for a prince who got there with the help of popular favor. He'll be able to exercise the principality single-handedly with few, if any, people unwilling to obey him. Furthermore, 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 a prince can't satisfy the nobles. Do you need a headphone mic? Furthermore, a prince can't satisfy the nobles without acting wrongly and harming others because what the nobles want is to oppress the people, whereas he can satisfy the people without harming anyone. All right, so this is, wrong. This is important right here. This is really important. See, the, the nobles want to oppress the people. You understand? So he's like, there, there are going to be elites in the community, and they want to oppress the people. And again, he's not talking about black folk. He's not talking about racism. He's saying that white people want to oppress white people and again like i said go back to it if the frog if the crocodile eats the frog's eggs uh, if the crocodile eats its own eggs what's it going to do to the flesh of a frog if white folk want to oppress their own people why would you think you will not be oppressed come on and furthermore a prince can't satisfy the nobles without acting wrongly and harming others Okay, because what the nobles want is to oppress the people, whereas he can satisfy the people without harming anyone because their desires are more honorable than those of the nobles. All the people want is to not be oppressed. Also, a prince can't secure himself against a hostile people because there are too many of them, whereas he can secure himself from the nobles because there aren't many of them. I should add a few words explaining what the content is to secure himself against, what the threats are from those two directions. The worst that a prince can expect if the prince, the people hold, turn hostile is that they will abandon him. But if the nobles turn hostile, he has to fear not only that they will abandon him, but also that they will attack him. See, again, the elites have access to military. This is, one of the, like, this is just... The thing is, this, this is actually 
what you have to understand is this is actually an African system. Okay? Hey, hey, hey! Oh, man, dang it. All right. All right. This is actually an African system that was just put into Europe because essentially the first monarchs in the world uh, are African. Uh, give me a second to tell this kid to get out of this. Yeah, sorry about that. This kid is uh, playing, playing my room. I, I don't know if I just messed with a button, though. Can you guys hear me just the same? Uh, can you guys hear me just the same? Anyway, let me, actually, let me, let me see if I could, uh, let me see if I can type you guys. Uh, I might have, I, I might have the button. I might have the button to lose my volume. Can you hear me just the same? All right. Anyway, so it says that I'm on negative zero dB. It's like it's like the same zero, so I'm just like I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, negative zero is still zero, but you know, it's, it's just different. All right, so let's see. Uh, oh yeah, so I'm saying that noble. So this is based off an African system. So the African system is that you would have these elites, you would have these kings, the kings would have this military, all that. Like every like you have to understand how important militaries are that, that fact that common people commoners do not have militaries okay nobles i mean elites do uh businesses do in a sense you know what i mean uh kings do but because the common people do not have you can't you don't have to oh they're just gonna walk away you know what i'm saying but the nobles would attack so nobles are more likely to attack than the people are and that's the saying there's a quality of people too there's a quality of people who can form militaries and this is what white people have to many white people understand that a lot like for instance you have to realize that some among us, if we were not uh, taken, from, or if, if Africa was not destroyed as it was, right, we would have been leaders in Africa. Okay? We would have been leaders in Africa. Some of us would have been. Some of us would have been followers. Okay? So you have the nobles who would be the leaders. Like, let's say this is Europe. Nobles would have been the leaders, and the commoners who would have just been the followers. Okay? Uh... Uh, and in Africa, it's the same thing. You would have people who would be leaders, people who would be followers. And so that's born into you. That's born into you in a sense, you know? And and, 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 and this is why white people would, would would try to win your, you know, quote-unquote leaders to their side. And, and you know, th th this is articulated all over the place. But, you know, it's just it's just something that's, like, fascinating, I think. Uh, human psychology. This is, this is real human psychology. You know what I'm saying? So the nobles are more likely to attack than the people are because they look ahead further and more intelligently than the people do and will always act early so as to protect themselves from dangers further down the line so as and so to obtain favors from whomever they expect to win in one respect though the people are more of a threat than the nobles namely the prince has to live always with the same people but he does not have to have always the same nobles because he can make and unmake nobles every day giving or taking away honors at will all right uh, so I didn't, I didn't get any comments on regards to the volume, so I'm just gonna keep it going. I'll try. Wait, should I? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if you can't hear me, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, let's keep going. Uh, I'll try to set all this out more clearly. The first question that you, as a prince, ought to ask about any noble is: Do does he behave in a way that ties his success and everything to yours? If he does and isn't greedy, he should be honored and loved. And for those who don't tie their success to yours, there are two cases to consider. The reason why a given noble doesn't link his success with yours may be that he is feeble and a coward. That is a man you should make use of, especially if he has good advice to offer. In times of prosperity, he will bring you honor, and when things go badly, you won't have to fear anything from him. A noble who doesn't commit himself to you because he has ambitious plans of his own shows that he is giving more thought to himself than to you, and a prince ought to keep a watchful eye of this man. Uh, fearing him as though he were an open enemy because in difficult times that's just what he will be so you see that like like again like who, who, what was Mobutu in in Lumumba's circle you know that's something we have to study 
what was Mobutu like? Was he, was he like, oh man, you know, Lamont was so great. Lamont was so, like, Lamont was doing some awesome stuff. Or was he like, shit, I need to get mine. You know what I'm saying? Because, because it seems like he might have been the latter. Now, he might have been good at hiding it. I don't know. But that's something that we should be studying. Because, and that's something you have to consider as you choose to nation build, wherever you choose to nation build. You know, you have to say to yourself, who are the people next to me? And how are they articulating themselves? And you have to figure out how they articulate themselves privately. If you can. You understand? You know, how, how do they talk to their wife? Do, do they go to their wife and say, do their wife say, oh, that's enough about, you know, stop talking so much about, you know, the leader. You know, stop talking so much about the king. You know what I'm saying? Or, do, or, or is their wife like, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get yours. You know what I'm saying? You gotta make sure you get yours. Oh, my food, my family needs food. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, what's going on? What's going on in their home life? Check it out. Peep game. Peep game. You gotta, you, cause this is life or death. You know, Lumumba was slaughtered. Lumumba was killed. Sankara was killed. You know, after, after fighting valiantly and brilliantly for their nations, they were, they were killed like, like animals. Great people. You know, you don't want to end up like that. Okay? So you have to study. You have to learn. All right? Someone who becomes a prince through popular favor then ought to keep the people friendly towards him. And this isn't difficult because all they ask of him is that he not oppress them. But someone who becomes a prince through the favor of the nobles against the people's wishes should make it his first priority to win the people over to himself. And he can easily do this by taking them under his protection. When men are well treated by someone, the loyalty they'll have towards their benefactor will be especially great if they had expected him to treat them badly. The prince can win their affection in many ways, but I shan't go into this because there are two various, depending on circumstances, to be brought under fixed rules. The bottom line is simply this. A prince must have the people friendly toward him, otherwise he has no security in difficult times. Nabus, prince of the Spartans, successfully defended his country and his government against an attack by all Greece, and by a victorious Roman army to overcome this peril, he had to make himself secure against a few of his subjects, but a more but a mere few wouldn't have been sufficient if the people had been hostile to him. Don't challenge what I am saying here by producing the trite proverb that he who builds on the people builds on mud, for this is not unrestrictedly true. The proverb look at that, they have proverbs back in the day. The true I mean of course they do, but still. The proverb is true when so he's using like European proverbs, you know? Like if they were a conquered people, they would be like, Oh, European proverb, oh look at the European wisdom. You know, he who builds on the people builds on mud. <laughs> you see, you see, how, you see how disturbing their freaking problems are too. Anyway, uh, it's not strictly true. The problem is true when a private citizen builds his power on the foundation, persuading himself that the people will free him when he is oppressed by his enemy or by the magistrates. That would be prince may very well be disappointed by the outcome. That would that would be prince may be very difficult by the outcome, as were the Gracchi in Rome and the Georgi Scali in Florence. But if it's a prince who has established himself on a popular favor, a prince who knows how to leave, is brave, keeps his head in a crisis, takes the right precautions, and by his own resolution and energy keeps the whole people encouraged, he'll be disappointed. It will turn out that he laid a good foundation for his power. So this is actually pretty important. So this is what you have to realize. Private citizen. So what's a private citizen? You know? Basically, if you're not the prince of a nation, right? Basically, all right, let's use, let's use modern terms, right? If you are not a... Uh, 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 if you are in another person's nation, right, then you're just a private citizen. And you can't expect to be protected against that nation. Okay? The nation should do well to be good to its own people, right? To be good to its citizens. But if you think, like, like for instance, if I say, you know, I'm going to fight America. You know, like I'm a citizen of America, let's say. I'm going to fight America because, you know, blah, blah, blah. Right? So I'm saying I'm going to fight America, right? And I'm like, oh, the people are gonna protect me. How? You know, it's like it's like it's like the, the the brother. I think his name is John Africa. He's of the Move Nine, right? Oh, he's of not the Move Nine. Move, right? They had they had. I think they had one building. I don't know. I think they had one building. The state bombed a row of buildings, killing most of them and then jailing nine of them for fifty something years. And and I'm not saying they had the people's support, but the reality is that there's nothing the people could have done against. The state aerial bombing them, and this is like in 1980 something. You understand? This is a 1980 something. Like I, I was, I was, I was just about born. You know what I mean? And and the people just got out of prison, like like within two years ago, like like two years ago, three years ago. Come on, 30 something years in prison. Cause cause you can't expect the people to protect you 
in a nation that's not your own. That's why you want to build your own nation or just shut the front door. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> just shut the front door. Uh, all right, now. Uh, all right, let's see. The kind of prince is most at risk when he is passing from civil to absolute government. Let us look at why this is so. The prince in question rules either personally or through magistrates. If through magistrates, that is a source of weakness and insecurity in his government because it rests entirely on the goodwill of the citizens who have been raised to the magistracy, uh, magistracy and who can, especially in troubled times, easily destroy the government through intrigue or open defiance. And at such times, the prince won't be able to exercise absolute authority because his subjects, accustomed as they are to getting orders from magistrates, aren't going to start taking orders from him in a time of crisis. Right, so that's saying if you have underlings, right? And at such such times, there will always be a scarcity of men the prince can trust. He can't rely on what he sees when things are quiet and the go citizens need the government. At such times, everyone comes running. Everyone promises to do what he wants. Everyone wants to die for him, where there's no immediate prospect of death. You know? So look at that right here. You see that same thing? Uh, scarcity of men can be trusted. So so and this is like Wazungu stuff. So Wazungu can't really trust the person next to him. Now obviously I keep bringing up Mobutu because you can't really trust the, you can't really trust the African next to you. But that's only because a lot of us are Eurasianized. You know what I mean? Uh, you know like like I said like you know you really can't trust folk. Okay? You really can't trust folk. That that's that's just one of the lessons that you gotta you gotta know in life. You know unless they uh they 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 really come with the same ideological background that's why i encourage you to do the reading go read the book of power go read because when you read when you share the same reading the same knowledge base right that's when trust can really be established because if you don't know you you, know, you don't know you know what i mean like, like a lot of like, like 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 i'm not gonna say mabutu knew a lot you know what i'm saying i'm not gonna say i'm not gonna say that i like i'm not gonna say i like because like I, I think inside the book of power i write down like it's an unpublished letter by sankata Okay, and he's like, oh, we gotta change the stuff because we're, you know, like he's, he's like, oh, we're, we have, a, we have, a, we have, a, we have a stake in the, in the movement. You know what I'm saying? But he didn't even publish the letter yet. He was killed like the night of or something like that, right, right before he was about to give it or something. You know what I mean? Uh, like it's like a speech, by the matter of fact. Like you know, like it's, it's complicated. But anyway, let's like say he says the citizens need. He can't rely on what he sees when things are quiet, and the citizens need government. So the citizens need government. And at such times, everyone comes running. Everybody promises to do what he wants, blah, blah, blah. But in troubled times, when the government needs the citizens, he finds that very few show up. Mightn't the prince at least try relying on a citizen's loyalty? That would be a risky experiment, made all the more dangerous by the fact that it can be tried only once. So a shrewd prince ought to handle things in such a way that his citizens will always, in all circumstances, need the government and need him. Then he will always find them loyal. See what I'm saying? So, so you see what he's saying? He's saying that, look... It would be wise for a prince or a nation or whatever to make it so that the people always need them. And, and what is the circumstance you're in? What is the circumstance you're in? What is the circumstance that you're in? Come on. Chapter 10. How to measure the strength of a principality. In examining the character of any of these principalities, we have to face the question, does this prince, one, have enough power to be able to rely on his own resources in time of need, or does he, too, have to get help from others? Let me be clear about the line I am drawing. It is between, one, the prince who has enough men or money to be able to raise a sufficient army to join battle against any attacker, and... Two, the prince who can't show himself against the enemy in the field has a shelter behind the walls of his city waiting for help to come. Uh, I have discussed one in chapter 6 and will return to it in chapters 12 to 14. All I can say about two is to advise such prince to provision and fortify their cities and not to defend their rural areas. If a prince had fortified his city well and has managed his subjects' concerns in the way I have described and returned to later, others will be very cautious about attacking him. Men are never enthusiastic about enterprises that they can see will be difficult, and it will be seen to be difficult to attack a ruler who has his cities well fortified and isn't hated by his people. So, I mean, like like, like I said, you know, maybe someday I could, like, I'm not, I don't want, I, sometimes I kind of want to do some video game streaming, you know? I actually got this video game, it's called, I told you, I told you guys about it before, uh, I, didn't, I didn't give the name, actually, so <laughs> we're not giving the name. But, but basically, like, you can uh, get yourself a castle, and you can, uh, like, like you can siege castles. And uh, what happens when you siege castles is that it would take a long time to siege a castle, you know? Because the castle, like, it would take, like, 30 days, like, 30 game days to, to, to siege a castle. So, like, you could move from one city to another city in like eight hours or, something, or nine hours or something like that you know what i mean but you would have to stay 
sieging a city for 30 days. And what, what happens in those 30 days, because, the, the, because the, the city stocks food for a month. And if the city is a part of, 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 a, of a whole other, you know, uh, kingdom or whatever, right? Then that kingdom has 30 days to answer your attack. You understand? So you're going to be fighting multiple armies often and, and often and often. Unless you try to break the siege and, and just uh, attack the castle outright. But then you're dealing with, you know, fighting, you know, like hundreds of soldiers. You get what I'm saying? Like, because you're fighting the garrison now, you know, and you're like severely outnumbered. And of course, it's just a fun game. You know, like I said, I could probably stream it if y'all were like, yo, what the, if y'all weren't like, what the, why are you streaming video games? But anyway, but like, you know, I, I say this to say that, you know, like, like, like the reason why I bring that up too is to say that this is where white folk read this book, then they make visual representations of it. And those are video games. Okay? So they make video games that teach you more about, uh, like like their story okay they teach you more about their stories so that they can uh go about and 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 like like teach their young about war and all that kind of stuff and about kingdoms and nations and in a, in a where in, in a accessible way more accessible than reading this book you know what i mean well, of course this is a short book that's already accessible but still you know it's just more entertaining more fun yada yada so the cities of germany are absolutely independent uh, they have little rural territory. They obey the emperor when it suits them to, and they aren't afraid of the emperor or any of their neighbors. That's because, and this, this was back when Germany was weak. This is because they are so well fortified that everyone thinks it would be tedious and difficult to take them. They all have good moats and walls, enough artillery and public depots with enough food, drink, and fuel to last a year. A year. So you'd have to you'd have to siege them for a year. Okay. You have to siege them for a year, and when they uh, and after so so that's to say that you have to have supplies. You have to have a year's long supply, okay? And then on top of that, you have to protect yourself against attack of other people. And that also means that you have to have a year of wages for your soldiers. You know what I mean? So it's it's really tough. So and it's important the people. Yeah, I'm blowing up, right? Anyway, all right, <laughs> all right. That's because they are so well fortified that everyone thinks it will be tedious and difficult to take them. They all have good moats and walls, enough artillery and public depots with enough food, drink, and fuel to last a year. And remember, I said that my video game was like uh, 30 days, right? And that's 30 days of you know getting attacked by other people, pretty much, right? And to support the people without public expenditure on handouts, they have a stock of raw materials that will provide a year's work in trades that are the city's lifeblood and thus a year's wages for the works in them. They also have respect for military exercises and have many rules to make sure that they are held. So so you see what it is. Like, this is back in ancient... Uh, not ancient. This is, I guess... It's, it's, it's a long time ago. But Germany already had this, you know, oh, we're going to be able to defend ourselves. Like, the main thing that we're going to be able to do is defend ourselves. What about you? Like, 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 like right now, like, like, look at this. Look at this right here. Look, look at, pay attention to what this, what this, what this said. They have a year's worth of food. How is it that when COVID hit, right? And COVID is not even for a year yet, right? People starve. Why are you starving? Why are you starving? Why don't you have a year's worth of food stocked up? And I'm not saying that I do. I'm saying that you see how people are organized, right? You see how people are organized to deal with uh, external threats, and then you see what happens when they're, like, those who fail to plan do what? Plan to fail. Come on. Alright? So, they are held. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Military exercises. See what I'm saying? Thus, a prince who has a strong city and hasn't made himself hated won't be attacked. Anyone who did attack him would be driven off, humiliated, because this world is so changeable that it is almost impossible to keep an army idle, besieging a city for a whole year. Someone may object. If the people have property outside the city and see it burnt, they won't remain patient. The long siege and self-interest will make them forget their prince. I reply that a strong and energetic prince will overcome all such difficulties by giving his subjects hope that the trouble will soon be over, scaring them with tales of the enemy's cruelty and moving nimbly to protect himself from those of his subjects who seem to, who seem to him to be too bold. And also, as the enemies approach, the city will, they will naturally burn and ruin the countryside. Also, as the enemy approach the city, 
they will naturally burn and ruin the countryside. This will happen at a time when the spirits of the people are still high and they are determined to resist. This would actually encourage the prince because a few days later, when spirits have cooled, the damage is already done, the bad things have happened, and there's no remedy for them. So the people will be all the more ready to support their prince because he seems to be under obligation to them now that their houses have been burnt and their possessions ruined in his defense. They will support him because he is obliged to them. Yes, because it's human nature to be bound by the benefits one gives as much as by those one receives. All things considered, therefore, it is... It won't be hard for a wise prince to keep the minds of his citizens steadfast throughout a siege as long as they have food and weapons. You have to have food and weapons. So this is, let me see if this is the last one. Let me see. Uh, yeah, okay. So wait, let me see. How long is this one? Uh, okay, so we'll just do, we'll just do, oh, mercenary sounds like an interesting subject, so we can actually jump into that another time. Oh, oh look at that. This is actually part two. So we'll just finish part one. Uh like that's like poetic you know and then we'll go about it so ecclesiastic principality so up to here i have been discussing kinds of states and ways of becoming a prince i am nearly finished with that whole topic right let me just make sure i'm not skipping anything yeah uh and i don't know you guys like that that prince example let's see so terry not says damn i missed a lot uh, Bit of Medicine says, me too. I want to stream a game too. Aha, <laughs> you want to stream a game too. All right. Mercedes says, given how much power the West over have over Africa, and they also have strategies of ruling more complicated as this, can we achieve a Pan-African state without America, China, and England dying? Uh, definitely. We could definitely achieve a Pan-African state without those countries dying, because those countries aren't dying. Uh, tarry not. We might need to go to a place in the middle of nowhere and establish ourselves. Uh, maybe, but not, yeah. Terry Knott also said, "LOL, I because we don't have the luxury of waiting for our people to wake up before we go extinct." Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. That's why I said, you know, I mean, we're gonna be writing this book. Uh, we're gonna be writing this. Uh, we're gonna be writing this thing to radicalize our people. You know, so we want to do that. So let's see. Uh, Mercedes also said, "How many more ways to rule books like this are guilds, cults, and the elite sitting on?" Oh yeah, definitely a lot. The whole thing with this, I want to say. We talk about it casually. There's this group. What's the group called? The Masons. The Masons are, like, what does Mason mean? Builders. So they're passing down knowledge on how to rule, how to govern, how to build, you know, architecture and, and, the, and the laying foundations and all that kind of stuff. That's what Masonry is. So when we say the Masons rule, they're a secret society, blah, blah, blah. That's not false. There was this one brother I knew. He's a brother, in fact, but, but he's from, like, another country. But still, he's a brother, and he's like, he's in, a, he's, a, he's like, if I tell you what's going on, the Masons, I'll have to kill you. And you know, the first thing he told me, and I was like, yeah, I'm not trying to be too close to you, real talk, because you just threatened me for no damn reason. But, but like, it's a real thing, you know. And and the thing is that a lot of black people were a part of that, you know. But it's it's really passing down knowledge on building uh, nations and so on and so forth. And that's why you have the quote unquote Moorish Temple. You know, they they were like an offshoot of the Masons, as far as I, if I remember correctly. And it is about nation building, you know? So they do have guides on, on, on nations and nationalities and all that stuff. So a lot of it is pretty popular. It's just that we don't read. It's like if you want to hide something from a black person, just put it in a book. This Machiavelli character, like, you got to realize Tupac Shakur is named after Machiavelli. You know, he named himself Machiavelli. You know, so it's like, it's not like this is hidden knowledge. It's just that we just don't read, you know? Like, like I mean, because I, I never read it. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even read. You know what I'm saying? All right, you know, and, and you and you know, I mean, in these days I'm considered well read. You know what I'm saying? I don't even read, so it's like you know, you already know. All right, so up to here, I've been discussing kinds of states and ways of becoming a prince. I am nearly finished with that whole topic. All that is left for me to discuss are ecclesiastic principalities, church states, the difficulties that occur in relation to these concern what happens on the way to getting possession because once such a principality has been acquired whether by virtue or by fortuna it can be held onto without either that's because church states are backed by ancient religious institutions that are so powerful and of such a character that their princes can stay in power no matter how they behave and live these are the only princes who have states that they don't defend and subjects whom they don't rule and the states although unguarded are not taken from them and the subjects don't mind not being ruled and don't want to alienate themselves and have no way of doing so there are the only principalities that are secure and happy, but they are upheld by divine powers to which the human mind can't reach, so I shan't say anything more about them. They are raised up and maintained by a G, and it won't be it would be presumptuous and rash to discuss them. Except for one matter, someone may ask 
want to ask. And so he's talking about the church and all that kind of stuff, and you know, like religious principalities. And that's like something that we ha- we find in Africa too. Like I want to say that the, the Akan is like a spiritual spiritual, you know, like the rulers in Akan culture, or or the Igbo culture, the Yoruba culture, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, they are actually religious figures, you know, uh, and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, yeah, and I, actually, I, I don't even say that like ancient Kemet might have been one of these things, you know, because you know the 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 the, the emperor would have been uh, would have been that, you know, would have been like a divine ruler, you know. Uh, except for one matter, someone was asked, uh, how does it come about that the church has so greatly increased its temporal uh, power before the papacy of Alexander the sixth, the Italian rulers. Not only the great states, but every baron and lord, however minor, regarded the church's temporal power as almost negligible. But now as the king of France trembles before it, and it has been able to drive him from Italy and to ruin the Venetians, what happened? So he's asking what happened. Let's see. Um, So he says, though the answer is well known, it may be worthwhile for us to remind ourselves of it. Before King Charles VIII of France moved into Italy, this country was dominated by the popes, the Venetians, the king of Naples, the duke of Milan, and the Florentines. Each of these powers had two main concerns. One, that no foreign army should enter Italy, and two, none of the other four should seize more territory. The, those about whom these were the more anxiety were the popes and the Venetians. They, the, Flo- the Venetians could be held back only by the other three working together, and to keep down the popes and the others made use of the barons of Rome. They were split into two factions, the Arsenes and the Kaanas, who were always on the brink of outright fighting. So there, so there they were, weapons at the ready, under the eyes of the Pope, and this kept the papacy weak and indecisive. The brevity of each individual papacy contributed to this. Popes have on average reigned for ten years, and that is hardly enough for a Pope to pull down one of the factions. And if, for example, one Pope came near to destroying the Kaanas, he would be succeeded by one who was hostile to the Arsenes. That successor would pull the Kaanas up again and would have enough time to ruin the Arsenes. That's why the Pope's temporal power weren't given much respect in Italy. Uh, then came Pope Alexander VI, who, more than any previous Pope, showed what a Pope could do with money and arms. Un- using Duke Valentino Cesare Borgia and exploiting the opportunities provided by the French invasion of Italy, he did all the things that I mentioned in Chapter 7 when discussing the uh, Duke's actions. His aim was to build up the Duke, not the Church, but his actions did make the Church more powerful. And that increased power was the legacy that was left to the Church after Alexander's death and the downfall of his son. After Alexander, there was Pope Julius II, who found the Church strong and had control of all of Romagna and the Roman barons, and their factions had been wiped out by Alexander's severity. Julius also found a way for the Church to accumulate money, a way that had never been followed by Alexander VI. Julius didn't just follow these policies, he improved upon them. He planned to capture Bologna, or Bologna, I don't know, to squelch the Venetians and to chase the French out of Italy. He succeeded in all this, and what makes this especially creditable is that he did it to strengthen the church and not to benefit any private person. Alexander sought to benefit his son. He also kept the Orsini and Kalana factions within the bounds in which he found them, and although a few of their leaders were poised to make trouble, two things held them back, the greatness of the church, of which Julius terrified them, and their not having their own cardinals. When these factions had their cardinals, they don't remain quiet for long, because cardinals take sides, both inside Rome and out of it, and the barons are compelled to support them. In this way, the ambitions of the prelates uh, generates disorder and tumults among the barons. For these reasons, His Holiness Pope Leo X, formerly the Cardinal de Medici, found the papacy in a very strong condition, and is to be hoped that there, are, that where others made it great through force, he will make it even greater and more venerated through the goodness and his countless other virtues. So Pope Leo the Ten. So I'm actually kind of curious because they're talking about the popes, because we know that one of these popes gave their blessings for the uh, enslavement of Africans. I don't know if this was. I feel like this was before uh, all this talked about Pope Alexander the Sixth. So I don't know, but. There you have it, family. Uh, that was part one of this book. Let me know what you think. Did you like that? I mean, I know it was long and extended, so I don't, you know, I don't really, uh, like, I know I know it takes a long time. I was thinking it was going to be three hours, to be honest, but because I, I realized that, 
Well, no, I thought it was going to be three hours to read the whole book. I'm surprised it took me three hours to read half the book. But I think it's because the book might be formatted in such a way that it's actually twice as long. Because when I looked at other editions, they were like, it was like a 200-page book. You know what I mean? So I don't know why this book is only uh, 60 pages, but that might be it. But also, I keep ta- I keep stopping to talk, and, you know, hopefully you enjoy that. But if not, you know, you know, like, whatever. Right? <laughs> but if you do like it, you know, drop a like. And all that kind of stuff. But uh, thank you so much for listening. It's been a pleasure to, you know, have you here with me. Uh, hopefully, you, you'll, you know, when I read the second part, you could be there too. And if you have any other comments, you know, please drop some drop, drop some comments in the description below. But otherwise, uh, this was this is this is a this was this is a fun read, and hopefully, you know, the part two will be just as fun. And uh, and and of course, you know, you're welcome to join the Discord, and you're welcome to to discuss uh terry nazis thank you uh, thanks terry and then you know you're welcome to join the the discord you're welcome to you know read the book ahead i guess i don't know but you're also welcome to you know share in writing this document that we're we're, we're trying to work on to or this presentation we're trying to work on to get our people radicalized so that we can get the love of the people you know on our side you know so thanks so much family bit of medicine's gonna replay the replay so that's nice you know, and I appreciate everybody for listening. So, Shemiam Hotep and Italia too.